to March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Hello, good afternoon and welcome to GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir. I look so small here. <laughs> how will I get bigger? And for the next few hours, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines right now. This show is all about opinion. It's mine, it's theirs, and of course it's yours. We'll be debating, discussing, and at times we will disagree, but no one will be cancelled. So joining me in the next hour, broadcaster and columnist Lizzie Cundy and also former Labour Party advisor Matthew Laza. Before we get started, let's get your latest news headlines. Thanks, Nana. A very good afternoon to you. It is three o'clock here in the GB newsroom. The Russian president is continuing to link Ukraine to last night's attack in Moscow, which killed at least 133 people. The United States says it believes the attack was carried out by a branch of the Islamic State terror group known as ISIS-K. Kyiv described Russia's apparent attempt to blame Ukraine as absolutely untenable and absurd. Neither Vladimir Putin nor the FSB Security Service have presented any proof of a link with Ukraine. In an address to the nation, Vladimir Putin said it was an attack on the Russian people and vowed justice would be served. All the executors, planners and those who ordered this crime will be rightfully and inevitably punished, whoever they are and whoever directed them. Let me repeat, we will identify and punish everyone who stood behind the terrorists who prepared this attack against Russia, against our people. Cancer charities have praised the Princess of Wales for speaking out about her diagnosis, saying it will encourage others with concerns to visit their doctor. Kate says she and William have been doing everything possible to process and manage the shock news privately for the sake of their young family. The King described her as courageous for choosing to speak out publicly about her condition. It's after the future Queen revealed on Friday she began a course of preventative chemotherapy last month. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family, but I've had a fantastic medical team who have taken great care of me, for which I'm so grateful. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy 
and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. Well, GB News spoke to people on the streets of Birmingham who sent their well wishes to the future Queen. It's got shocking, really. She's got young kids, she's got a family. I think that's probably the more upsetting thing about everything. The public eye and things doesn't really matter at the minute, does it? I think it was a brave decision, and I think that will just uh, awaken people's minds to uh, how, how troublesome cancer is yeah. and to be checked out themselves. Yeah, it's very shocking, really, and obviously, um, you know, it's one in two people are getting cancer now, so I think we all should be a little bit more respectful and just let her get on with it and, uh, you know, to recover with her family and just lay off her a little bit, you know. I think she had a lot of scrutiny over the last few weeks. Gareth Southgate says the controversy over the New England shirt is not high on his list of priorities as they prepare to face Brazil. Nike's new kit's been criticised over what it's described as a playful redesign of the St George's Cross, with the Prime Minister warning against messing with the national flag. But the FA has defended the changes, saying it's a tribute to the 1966 World Cup winning team. It's understood to be selling quickly, despite costing £125. The England manager says the Three Lions crest is the most important thing on the shirt. More than 80 pubs, clubs and sports centres across the country will receive a funding boost to help keep their doors open. It is part of the government's levelling up programme, which aims to create jobs and support communities. Amongst the local businesses benefiting from more than £33 million worth of investment will be Le Pub, much-loved music venue in Newport, and the Shrewsbury Arms in Kingstone, which will get its roof replaced. Uh, curtains will rise again at the Edinburgh Film House two years after it was forced to close. It follows a grassroots campaign backed by the actors Ewan Bremner and Brian Cox, and so the independent cinema will get uh, funding worth around £1.5 million. And if you've ever wondered what happened to Agatha Christie's typewriter, and who hasn't, well, the mystery is solved. It's set to go on display as part of a crime fiction exhibition at Cambridge University Library. Her dictaphone will also be part of the show, along with a typescript for her final novel, which featured the famed detective Hercule Poirot, titled Curtain. The exhibition, Murder by the Book, which opens today, explores Britain's fondness for fictional sleuths, from Sherlock Holmes to Jane Tennyson. You can get GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or going to our website. Now, it's back to Nana. Thank you, Aaron. It is fast approaching seven minutes after three o'clock, six minutes even after three o'clock. This is GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir. Coming up, I'll be bringing you the latest on the Princess of Wales' cancer announcement live from Windsor. Then at 3.20, we'll have uh, an update with what's been happening in Russia as more than 100 people have been killed in a catastrophic terror attack. Then at 3.35, Dr Pam Spur will be live to discuss what Kate's announcement could mean for her close friends and family. And Aman Bogle is in the political spotlight this week as he talks about his role as chairman of the Global Britain Centre and the week's political developments. That's coming up in the next hour. Tell me what you think on everything we're discussing. Email gbviews at gbnews.com or tweet me at gbnews. So, of course, the uh, big news of the day, the Princess of Wales has bravely told the world that she's undergoing chemotherapy for cancer in the emotional video message that we watched last night. The Princess said it was a huge shock and that the past couple of months have been incredibly tough for her family. Let's have a listen to what she had to say. I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you personally for all the wonderful messages of support and for your understanding whilst I've been recovering from surgery. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family, but I've had a fantastic medical team who have taken great care of me, for which I'm so grateful. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. This, of course, came as a huge shock. 
and William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. As you can imagine, this has taken time. It has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment. But most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be okay. As I've said to them, I am well and getting stronger every day by focusing on the things that will help me heal in my mind, body and spirits. Having William by my side is a great source of comfort and reassurance too, as is the love, support and kindness that has been shown by so many of you. It means so much to us both. We hope that you'll understand that as a family, we now need some time, space and privacy while I complete my treatment. My work has always brought me a deep sense of joy and I look forward to being back when I'm able. But for now, I must focus on making a full recovery. At this time, I'm also thinking of all those whose lives have been affected by cancer. For everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. What a beautiful woman. Well, listen, I'm joined now by GB News Royal correspondent Cameron Walker. Uh, Cameron, so uh, talk to me, uh, where are you? And um, what? Do, obviously, we don't have any more information, but what can you tell us? Well, Nana, I'm outside Windsor Castle, and it was within the grounds of Windsor Castle on Wednesday that the Princess of Wales recorded that special message to the British public. And since it was released at six o'clock last night, messages have been pouring in of love and support for the Princess of Wales, and members of the public have been laying flowers outside the castle uh, this afternoon. One message, which accompanies a, a bunch of flowers, said, Your Royal Highness, I wish you from the depths of my heart a certain and lasting recovery from this treatment and my thoughts are with you at every moment and there are several more messages like that online and in our GB News inbox as well. Clearly for the princess there's been a lot to process this news being diagnosed with cancer and undergoing preventative chemotherapy but also for the Prince of Wales whose father and wife are both battling cancer and he will have to balance his constitutional role as heir apparent and future king as well as being a father and a loving husband as well and supporting his young family. Uh, I'm told that the Prince and Princess, well, the Prince, Princess of Wales's priority is very much their three young children. Prince George is 10, Princess Charlotte is 8 and Prince Louis is 5. And they wanted to tell the children about the princess's condition at a time that was right for them. All three children are now off school. They are, uh, ten, uh, uh, they're on their Easter holidays, which is why the princess decided yesterday was the right time to release that message to the British public because the children are off school, therefore they are protected in the compounds of either Windsor Castle or Norfolk or somewhere else. Kensington Palace, understandably, does not want us to speculate about the state of the Princess of Wales's health other than the fact that she has uh, cancer and she is undergoing uh, treatments for that. She started that treatment at the end of last month and even if we just uh, go back to what the princess said there, she said, we now need some time, space and privacy to complete that treatment. Clearly, she's 42 years old. She's going to be receiving some of the best medical care this country can offer. Uh, tributes have been pouring in from those close to her. Charles Spencer, the, di the brother of uh, the late Princess Diana, said her message was uh, showed incredible strength and poise. His Majesty the King's spokesperson last night told me that His Majesty is proud of his beloved daughter-in-law and for her courage. James Middleton, her brother, posted on Instagram saying, over the years we have climbed many mountains together. As a family, we will climb this one with you too. And even the Duke and Duchess of Sussex released a message of support from California saying we wish health and healing for Kate and the family and hope they are able to do so privately and in peace. And that word, that sentiment, privacy and in peace, is something which I think the princess clearly wants right now. She's putting her family first. Prince William is putting his family first and they want the time and space for the princess to heal. Yeah, absolutely. Cameron Walker, thank you very much. Well, I can now speak with reporters Jack Carson in Birmingham and also Jeff Moody, who is there in Devon. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, you, Jack Carson. Talk to me about uh, um, what people have been saying. 
Well, certainly the, the feeling that's been echoing here from the Midlands and in, in Birmingham, where I am today, is, is that support really being passed on uh, to Princess Catherine. A lot of people, um, as you're hearing there uh, from, from Cameron, shocked really um, at the announcement of, you know, the, the speculation had been wild across social media, or even people that maybe didn't want to go down. Um, some of those um, mad conspiracy theories were still starting to wonder and starting to worry, of course, exactly about the condition uh, of the Princess of Wales. So that announcement yesterday confirming um, that she has been diagnosed uh, with a form of uh, cancer and will undergo treatment for that. Certainly uh, very shocking, but also actually some people quite angry that they feel like maybe because of that speculation, she's been forced into this decision, forced to be so public uh, about her diagnosis. Take a listen to what a few people on the high street told me a little bit earlier on. Shocking, it's just a private matter, really, and I think the media and the press say they've hounded her for the last three months. Absolutely shocking. Just, just let them be. It's, it's a private matter between uh, Princess of Wales and the Prince of Wales. Just leave it at that now. Yeah, it's very shocking, really, and obviously, um, you know, it's one in two people are getting cancer now, so I think we all should be a little bit more respectful and just let her get on with it and, uh, you know, to recover with her family and just lay off her a little bit, you know. I think she had a lot of scrutiny over the last few weeks. So. She's got young kids, she's got a family. I think that's probably the more upsetting thing about everything. The public eye and things doesn't really matter at the minute, does it? Um, well, we were shocked, but knew that there was something not right. Um, you wouldn't keep things quiet for that long if it wasn't, if there wasn't something that was wrong. Yes, yeah, so as you can hear, there's some concern, of course, from the public, uh, you know, in the past few months about exactly uh, her condition. But actually, from some of the people I've spoken to, grateful that she has come out and actually been so publicly. That other side of the argument, uh, you know, there's around three million people um, in the UK estimated to have cancer. Somebody diagnosed every 90 seconds. And that message of support um, at the end of her, of, of her video saying you are not alone um, from the feeling I've got in Birmingham is going to bring a lot of strength to a lot of people. Jack Carson, thank you so much. That's Jack Carson. He's there in Birmingham. Let's go to Jeff Moody, who's in Devon. Jeff, what is the mood like there? What have people been saying? Well, very similar to what Jack was saying, really. First of all, a major sense of shock. We all knew that she was ill, but nobody had any idea quite how serious it was. And people are very surprised at the announcement yesterday. A lot of feeling and support and sympathy for Catherine as a person, having to come to terms with this, uh, and also for the family at large. A lot of people saying to me, you know, the Prince of Wales now has his wife uh, and his father, um, both having this diagnosis, both in a very similar a situation and a lot of people being very sympathetic for him and of course there's the anger too that's beginning to uh, spill in too of people saying well not only have they had to they, they've had to contend with these very personal very private issues they've had to do it in a very public way now and people saying well why on earth should she have to do what she did why should she have to make a statement we're all entitled to a private life we're all entitled to keep our own uh, health issues uh, private if we want to and people feeling that she shouldn't really have had to have made that statement even if she wanted to it wasn't something that people were feeling that she was perhaps forced into that a little bit and overall people are saying well let's hope that now now the announcement's been made now that all of the speculation is over we know what's wrong with her let's hope that she can now uh, be afforded the space and the time and most importantly the privacy uh, to overcome this disease at her own pace this is what people in South Modern in Devon have been saying to me this morning. It's absolutely tragic, absolutely tragic. I mean, you know, obviously if it's true, um, um, which, you know, hopefully it's not too bad, you know, and, um, you know, obviously everything that's been going on in the last few months, you know, I was sort of obviously quite concerned, but, you know, at the same time, she's, you know, should just be left to her own devices and, you know, hopefully get over this and live a normal life. I think she's a lovely lady. It just should be left alone to get on and, um, you know, just be left alone, really. It's nobody's business what's wrong with them at the end of the day, just because they're who they are and everyone thinks they've got a right to know everything and they don't. I just think it's very sad for the whole family, her father-in-law, herself, her husband, his father has got cancer, his wife possibly has cancer, whether it was all removed. 
having treatment for it. I just think it's very difficult for them and it's about time everybody left them alone. What do you really? think about all the media speculation about? Well, it's like a school playground. In the school playground, you get the people saying what they want to say when they want to say. Um, it's a form of bullying. It's online bullying. I think people were also very moved by the message itself. Somebody said to me, look, I'm not really a royal fan or supporter, but uh, I did shed a tear when I heard her message, particularly when she said, look, anyone else who's facing this diagnosis and this disease, you are not alone. That really rang true to an awful lot of people. Back to you, Nana. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much as well to Jack Carson there too. This is TV News. If you just tuned in, welcome on board. I'm Nana Aquir. It's just coming up to 19 minutes after 3 o'clock. We're live on TV, online and on digital radio. Coming up, Dr Pam Spurt will be live to discuss the impact of the Princess of Wales news on her family and, of course, her three young children. And don't forget, you can get in touch and send me your well wishes to the Princess of Wales to GB News at GBNews.com or tweet us at GB News. Next, the latest on the devastating terror attack in Moscow, where over 150 15 people are believed to have been killed by armed gunmen. This is GB News. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Yeah, well, when it comes to fish and chips, we all know they're a part of a British tradition and the Golden Chippy is, is an award-winning uh, restaurant and for years they've been serving the community here in Greenwich and even today on a Sunday they are fully packed today but this is the issue here we've got a mural and which says a great British meal residents who live in this area who've complained uh, to Greenwich Council who say it's inappropriate uh, considering it's in a conservation area here's what some of the local people we've been speaking to had to say What's wrong with it? It looks all right, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Look at some of the other they've got around in Greenwich. They don't want to take that down, do they? But when you've got something like this, it's half day, so they want to remove it. Fantastic artwork. I really like it. Reminds me of Banksy. Well, those are the views here from people who live in this local area. But I'm kindly joined by Chris, the owner. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. You've been here for 20 years now. Um, tell, tell me how this issue has come up. They take pictures. It's only been up for about a month. And uh, it's been very, very popular. I don't want to believe that any of the locals are uh, complaining that this is uh, too loud or anything like that. They say it's, it needs planning permission. How a little thing like this needs planning permission, I don't know. Are you working with an artist in this local area? I've got a local uh, guy that uh, does uh, murals. So he said, uh, would you like me to do something for you? I said, yes, why not? I said, make sure you leave a bit of space for people to stand there so they can uh, take some selfies or pictures or whatever they want to do from Golden Chippy. And it's been extremely popular. And not one person has come to me and said, that looks terrible. So I cannot imagine the person that complained about this. I think it's just cancelled. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon. It's just gone 22 minutes after 3 o'clock. This is GB News. We are the People's Channel. I'm Nana Aquir. 
Let's have a quick look at what you've been saying about the Princess of Wales. Robert says, Nana, you are so right. What a beautiful woman Princess Catherine is, with her kindness of spirit and consideration for others. Uh, Ruby's been in touch. She said, so sad to hear the faltering voice of the Princess of Wales trying to reassure her children, family and the nation that she's feeling well and getting stronger. We can only pray for a full recovery for the Princess, but also King Charles, and to give strength and fortitude to the Prince of Wales, who has to be strong for his wife, the children, and, of course, his father. Pat says, me and my American family, friends and co-workers pray for Princess Catherine, Prince William and their children's health and happiness. Well, keep all of your well wishes coming in. You've got the address, gbviews at gbnews.com. Well, now, at least 133 people are believed to have been killed following a devastating gun attack at a concert hall in Moscow on Friday. An affiliate of the Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for the attack, a claim that the United States says is credible. However, the deputy head of the Russian National Security Council has suggested that Ukraine was, in fact, responsible and has vowed vengeance. Well, I'm joined now by Martin Whitlock. Whitlock he's a historian and author. Uh, Martin, I want to start with the, the notion uh, that Islamic State are responsible for this. Uh, it do doesn't feel right, but America says it's credible. How, how are they linked with Russia? Well, it's a reminder that Russia has fought jihadists in the past, in the first Chechen War, 1994 to 96, the second Chechen War, 1999 to 2009, and in Syria, where Russia backed Assad against Islamic State um, and other groups in 2015 to 20, uh, 2016. So Russia actually has a track record of having conflict with uh, jihadi groups. There was recently a shootout between Russian security forces and an Afghan group with links to Islamic State in, um, in Gushetia. That's an area of the Northern Caucasus, a region where Russia has a history of conflict with jihadists and where earlier conflicts had spilled over from Chechnya. So while they are now seeking to blame Ukraine, I think that is really unconvincing because mm. whilst the Ukrainian Secret Service can be quite ruthless, uh, the HUR, the H-U-R, I don't see they have anything to gain from facilitating such an outrage. But there is a track record in Russia. Um, there were apartment bombings in 1999 in Moscow and other Russian cities, though some people weren't so sure about whether, in fact, jihadists were behind that. There was an attack on a theatre in Moscow, amongst other attacks in 2002, and the appalling Beslan school siege, which killed many civilians including children, in 2004. And so we need to remember that Russia actually has had a front mm. uh, in conflict with jihadist groups. It's, it's not just the Americans you know, in the Middle East. It's not just the Americans um, in, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. The Russians, too, have recently been in conflict with jihadist groups. And there are jihadist groups who feel they've got scores to settle with Putin's Russia. Why do you think, then, Putin seems to be so quick to blame Ukraine? What's in it for him? He's already bombing Ukraine. There's not much more damage he can do, just the same damage. I think, personally, it's about consolidating support in Russia behind him. Obviously, last week he won, in inverted commas, by a you know, huge landslide, again, in inverted commas, um, the Russian presidential election. And I think this is part of the Putin narrative, that, that everything tracks back to Ukraine, that Ukraine is an existential threat, um, the West is behind Ukraine's threat. I mean, all these, you know, as seen by Putin. And I think it's part of the narrative to try to bring everything back to Ukraine. During the presidential campaign that led up to last weekend's elections, the war was front and central in so much of what he said. So whilst I am really completely unconvinced by this, as indeed are the Americans mm. and other intelligence analysts, I think Putin is simply trying to rally people behind his war, and he's using this in order to do so. But I really do not think Ukraine are involved in this. I think it, it is an affiliate of Islamic State. And the, as we understand it, the, those who went in to commit this atrocious attack, many of them have actually been caught. 
Yes, yes. It does look as if the um, Russian security service, the FSB um, and other security agencies, have caught most of the people involved in this. So more may yet come out in due course, although obviously in Putin's Russia, things are very often manipulated and controlled, so we can't be sure of that. Yeah. But the terrible attack on civilians, this is very much a hallmark of these jihadi groups. I mean, think of the terrible things that happened in London um, on the underground uh, yeah. and on um, the buses. Think about what happened at the Bataclan um, in Paris in the appalling attack um, on that concert venue there. The attacks in Brussels as well. So this has all the hallmarks mm. of groups affiliated to Islamic State which go for these terrible high civilian casualty events to basically punish people they see as their enemies, whole communities, and draw attention to their cause. And they are totally without shame in this. They deliberately go to create huge civilian casualties. And we've seen it again this time. The figures at the moment I saw just before I came on, they're talking about 130 plus killed now, 140 plus injured. So this really is a very, very serious atrocity that's taken place at this concert um, on the outskirts of Moscow. Mm. The, only, the only lack of similarity with Islamic State and those from terror groups is they usually um, end up killing themselves as well in the process, so they would never be caught. So it, it, it does feel like potentially an ISIS attack, but again, it's unusual for the, those who perpetrated it to still be alive. That is a very good point. Um, I think one of the things we may have to remember is that Islamic State, if you like, is, is a very loose umbrella organization. Mm. And it has many groups affiliated to it. We have Islamic State in the Sahel, um, in the south of Sahara. We have Islamic State operating against the Taliban in Afghanistan, for example. So it is not a, a monolithic group. And it may well be that this particular group with with an affiliation towards Islamic State is not part of the main organization. And that may have meant there was a deviation from the usual mm. way of behaving, the modus operandi of the yeah. group. But you are right, that is a significant difference. And I have no doubt that intelligence agencies will be studying that and trying to work out what they understand from that in due course. Because normally, this is not the case. Normally, they blow themselves up, they fight to the end. Mm -hmm. So that is a difference, and we will need to be thinking about the significance of that. But as I say, Islamic State is not a monolithic group, and that may explain it or go partly towards explaining it. Mm -hmm. Does the world need to be seriously uh, worried now and even on more heightened alert? What does it do f to us in the UK? Does this have some serious impacts on our security? Well, I think it reminds us that whilst clearly over the last few months, a couple of years, we've been very focused on Ukraine, and mm. rightly so, the events since October the 7th have reminded us of the incredible turbulence, suffering and danger that emanates from the Middle East. And this is a reminder that these kind of extreme groups, jihadi groups, continue to pose a threat to the world community, mm. and that includes to the UK as well. I have no doubt that at the moment, our own counter-terrorist organisations, MI5, uh, MI6, will be looking very, very carefully at the state of alert in this country, because this doesn't mean to say it's about to happen in London, because it happened in Moscow, of course not. I wouldn't want to alarm people. But it means to say this level of threat can occur right across the world, and we are not immune from it, and we must never let our guard drop. Mm, we, we need to sort out our police force, our armed forces and all our security personnel to make sure that we are protected. Uh, Martin Whitlock, thank you so much for talking to me. He's a, a historian and author. Good to speak to you. So it's just coming up to 31 minutes after 3 o'clock. If you've just tuned in, welcome on board. I'm Nana Aquir. We're live on TV, online and on digital radio. Still to come, Amon Bogle will be joining me to shine a light on his Global Britain initiative as we discuss the week's top political stories. And as ever, don't forget, keep those messages coming. Uh, you can send them to gbviews at gbnews.com or tweet me at gbnews. But first, let's get your latest news headlines. Anna, thanks very much. Good afternoon from the newsroom. 3.31, a recap of the headlines this hour. The Russian president is continuing to link Ukraine to last night's attack in Moscow, which killed at least 133 people. 
The United States says it believes the attack was carried out by a branch of the Islamic State terror group known as ISIS-K. Kyiv have described Russia's apparent attempt to blame Ukraine as absolutely untenable and absurd. Neither Vladimir Putin nor the FSB have so far presented any proof of a link. In a statement to the nation, President Putin said it was an attack on the Russian people and he vowed that justice will be served. Cancer charities here in the UK have praised the Princess of Wales for speaking about her diagnosis, saying it will encourage others with concerns to visit their doctor. Kate said she and William have been doing everything possible to process and manage the shock news privately for, they say, the sake of their young family. The King has called her courageous for choosing to speak out publicly about her condition. Gareth Southgate says the controversy over the New England shirt is not high on his list of priorities as the team prepare to face Brazil. Nike's new kit has been criticised over what it's called a playful redesign of the St George's Cross, with the Prime Minister now warning against messing with the national flag. But the FA has defended the changes, saying it's a tribute to the 1966 World Cup winning team. The shirt's understood to be selling quickly, despite costing £125. In other news, campaigner and father of murdered schoolboy Damilola Taylor has died today at the age of 75 following prostate cancer. Richard Taylor's son was killed in 2000 in what became one of the UK's most high-profile killings. The 10-year-old was stabbed in the leg and left to die in a stairwell in South London. In the wake of his son's death, Mr Taylor set up the Damilola Taylor Trust to campaign against knife crime. And more than 80 pubs, clubs and sports centres across the country will receive a funding boost to help keep their doors open. It's part of the government's levelling up programme, which aims to create jobs and support communities. And it will also see curtains rise once again at the Edinburgh Filmhouse two years after it was forced to close. That follows a campaign backed by actors Ewan Bremner and Brian Cox. The independent cin cinema will get a funding boost worth around £1.5 million. Those are the headlines. Plenty more to come throughout the afternoon. And in the meantime, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. But now it's back to Nana. Thank you, Sam. Coming up, it's Political Spotlight, where Amon Bogle will be joining me live to shine a light on this week's politics. Next, Dr Pam Spur gives her take on how the Princess of Wales family will be reacting to this devastating news and their relationships going forward. And don't forget as well to get in touch and send us your well wishes to Kate at gbviews at gbnews.com or tweet us at gbnews. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. And I'd like to talk about Kate Middleton. Mm. Because I'm really confused here. Everyone, where is she? What is she doing? Why did she Photoshop this? Where this, what that? Is Why can't her? we just leave her alone? What is going on here? What, what's, your, what's your thoughts on this? I think it's tough because naturally, you know, if I was looking at this and we didn't have all the context of everything that's gone on in the royal family previously, I would be saying um, leave her alone. But at the same time, I think that the royal family have made a huge mistake by setting a certain precedent when it mm -hmm. comes to Meghan. And I think that when you've kind of branded Meghan as the one that's demanding privacy, but then not really realising that she's got a particular role and a duty and mm -hmm. has to kind of be paraded in front of us no matter what, then you end up in a position now when Kate really needs the privacy and she can't get it because we're so used to being in their business and finding out everything about them, even after they've given birth. Mm. That precedent I get when that, women... but what if, what if it's a mental health issue? What mm. if it's something like that or, mm. or a long, ongoing physical uh, thing that she doesn't want to talk about? But you know what it is? It's because everyone sees the royal family as like ambassadors, so they're thinking, well, she's at home, and some people controversially will be like, well, we need to see her. Mm. She's like the face of multiple charities. They're basically, unfortunately, with the royal family, if they're not mm. seen, people are like, well, what's the point of them? And I know that sounds harsh, but, you know, this is not some person that... She, she can't work from home. Well, she's been described as the golden goose. 100%. Yeah. She, I mean, yeah. you, they rely on her a lot, yeah. don't they? I mean, she's yeah. front page of the newspapers whenever she steps out. Yeah. It's been amazing, actually, seeing photos of her this morning, how much we all miss her. You know, we haven't seen mm. her since just after Christmas. Mm. Um, what do you think about her being... 
the one to apologise. Having her take the rap for it, even if she mm. did do it, I think that was was quite unfair, really. And they so should well. have had, you know, a, a bit a of one. a better strategy. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's fast approaching 38 minutes after 3 o'clock. This is GB News. We are live on TV online and on digital radio. Don't forget as well, you can download the GB News app. It's completely free. I'm Nana Aquir. Well, as of course, this is the big story. We've been talking about it. And, of course, we will absolutely respect the privacy of the Princess of Wales. But she's been very brave. She told the world that she's undergoing chemotherapy for cancer in an emotional video message yesterday. The Princess said it was a huge shock and that the past couple of months have been incredibly tough for her family. So joining me now to talk about that impact is Dr Pam Spur. She's a psychologist and commentator. Uh, Dr Pam Spur... Um, it's a, it's a frightening thing when someone discovers that they themselves have cancer and then to have to tell other people about it. Can, can you talk to me about the psychological impact that has and you know, what you think Catherine must have been going through? It's a tremendous um, impact and we, we can't underestimate how people go through... Oh, it's almost like a grieving process when you get a cancer diagnosis. People are, get, first go into a state of numbness and shock. And sometimes they, they pass into despair and then anger, you know, why me? And then with parents, Nana, a real issue is feeling guilty. I'm supposed to be the protector. I don't want to be ill around my children. And two thirds of women really struggle with that kind of guilt compared to 40% of men. I think men are better at compartmentalizing those sorts of painful feelings. So I can imagine that Catherine, building up to telling the children, probably felt this enormous sense of like, guilt. And it's totally unrealistic to feel that way, but it's a natural feeling. And one in two of us in the UK will at some point have a cancer diagnosis. So she's right, we are not alone. But it's how you go about it if you're a parent how you go about telling your children that is really crucial. Yeah, because she, there were some very specific words she used when she said age-appropriate way, when she was talking about imparting that news to them. And, you know, children are adorable, and especially when they're so young, they would have been trying to protect their mummy as much as they can, and she said that to let them know that she's OK. And so, again, you, you get the feeling that the children take on almost a burden as though they may feel it's partly or there's, there's some fault that's attributed to them. Well, I think you've got a good point there, Nan. A lot of children think, especially slightly older children, think, oh, my goodness, I can't do anything to upset mummy or daddy, mm. you know, whoever's got the diagnosis, because I'll just make it worse. Now, when I, I always give a guidance of what I call the three Ps. So if you've got to give this challenging information, you first plan it. So with, if you have a partner, with your partner, you plan and you think how your children might react. So you plan what to say. Next, you practice it. You go back and forth with each other and practice and think about the kind of questions your children might ask you and practice your answers. And the reason why I say this is the more comfortable you are with the language you're going to use with them, the more comfortable they'll be. And the third P is you put it into action in a calm moment, not on a Friday evening when the kids are tired after a long week of school. You have to really think when you're going to put this plan into action. And then that's when you're going to be feeling calm 
as calm as you can because children are emotional sponges. And if you're really upset delivering this news, it will compound their confusion, their worry, their upset. And the other point, Nana, is remember this is now a dynamic process for any family, for Kate and William and other families around the country. Their feelings will ebb and flow. The children at some points won't really be thinking about it. Other points they will be thinking about it, like if mummy or daddy's reacting badly to chemo. So it does ebb and flow, and it's a dynamic process, and you have to answer their questions because they'll have more questions as this process goes on. And you just, again, have to use those three Ps, plan it, you know, practice it, and then put it into action. And very briefly, we've got about 30 seconds left. William, the way he has managed this has been exceptional. And um, how do you think he must be feeling? I think every partner feels an enormous sense of this, what can I do? And many men in particular think, what can I say? I don't want to put my big man foot in it. You know, I don't want to say the wrong thing. And what I always tell men in that situation is just ask. Ask your partner what support they want. You know, just say, what do you, do you want to tell me when you want to talk about it and tell me when you don't want to talk about it and you want to have time out from talking about the big C. So men can really get in there if, it, if, if it's the woman with the cancer and really be supportive in that way by just saying, I'm not sure what to say, darling. Help me, because I want to help you. I'm here for you. Dr. Pam Spur, thank you so much, as ever. Brilliant. Thank you. That was Dr. Pam Spur. It's just coming up to 44 minutes after 3 o'clock. On the way, my monologue on the Princess of Wales's announcement. And don't forget to get in touch and send us your well wishes to her. Uh, GBviews at gbnews.com or tweet us at GBnews Next. Political Spotlight, where joining me to shine a light is Amon Bogle, who will discuss the government's battle over Rwanda, Kemi Badenoch and Labour's plans for government. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We're starting the weekend on a very showery note across the UK, quite a chilly northwesterly airstream too, but things do look brighter as we head into Sunday. The low pressure is anchored towards the northeast of the UK at the moment, feeding in that uh, brisk northwesterly airstream and plenty of showers around too. And we hold on to a very showery picture across the UK as we head into this evening. Still some heavy ones around with some hail and thunder in places. But notice as we go through the overnight period, the showers tend to become more focused towards northern and northwest facing areas. So some clear spells developing inland and towards the south and east of the UK. The winds just starting to ease down a touch too. But uh, temperatures generally holding up at 4 to 6 Celsius in towns and cities, but in rural spots down into low single figures where we could see a touch of frost by Sunday morning. As for Sunday itself, well, a brighter day in store across the bulk of the UK. Still a few showers towards the north and northwest. Lighter winds too tomorrow, and with more than a way of sunshine around, it should feel more pleasant out and about, with temperatures climbing to 10 to 13 Celsius. 13 down towards the south and southeast is 55 in Fahrenheit, which is close to the seasonal average for this time in March. As we head into Monday, though, we see more of an east-west split developing in the weather across the UK. Outbreaks of rain moving in across the west and southwest starting to turn quite heavy in places. Holding on to some sunshine towards the north and east, one or two wintry showers towards the far northeast of the UK. And as we head into the coming week, things will generally turn more unsettled, with temperatures close to the seasonal average, but rain never too far away. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, if you just joined me, welcome. This is GB News. We are the People's Channel. We're live on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir. And it's time now for this week's political spotlight. And joining me to shine a light is Amon Singh Bogle. He's the chairman of the Global Britain Centre, who has stood for Parliament twice and champions Britain's role around the world. Right, well, welcome. Thank you very much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me on your show, Nana. I'm so curious. Have you got a lot of hair in there or not much? Oh, oh absolutely. I think a little bit more than you, perhaps. But... Really? Oh, yes. Is it sort of afro styly or is it just all flowing locks? Flowing locks, as they should be, but, is it? <laughs> but I'm very proud of it. And, of course, I wear the turban uh, as with the dignity to keep it. Absolutely. I bet you take it out and then there's almost like a flow of wind as you go like that and your hair goes from side to side. I mean, it looks you should see me on my motorbike. <laughs> <laughs> You're a motorbike. Now, listen, uh, the other day I wrote you to piece in the Daily Mail and, of course, Kemi Badenoch talked about all these EDI drives and how, in the end, it was working out that white men and white people in particular were being penalised because of mm. this whole sort of... Um, let's talk about that, because people are always talking about this. Well, look, I think, uh, first of all, you know, this country is uh, the greatest nation on, on, on the face of this earth for a reason. It is the nation where you can build a life. It's the best nation to play, the best nation to earn, the best nation to work, and the best nation to raise a family. And the reason for that is rooted in three different things. Mm. Free enterprise, to get on with your life, free democracy so that you can have a say in how you run, and the whole idea of free liberty, that you, are, you can be who you are. And I think we have achieved all that mm. without having to delve into this identity-laced politics of the DEI. You know, it's rotting away at our nation, whether it's uh, the left that is instilling it or bringing in the culture wars, to bring in race into everything mm. that surrounds us. It simply isn't the case. The average man and woman out there couldn't care less about whether you're black, brown or white. They care about your character, what you bring to the table and where you're going. Mm -hmm. Well, well I, I couldn't say that more. And I, I, I get a lot of comments from people say, yeah, but you're just pulling out the drawbridge now, you've taken advantage of it. But I haven't. On the I, contrary. I, I've never, ever... I, I, I don't think I've ever really been positively discriminated. I've always literally written four jobs myself or yes. phoned them up and said, give me a job. Look, uh, Britain is the greatest meritocracy in the history of, uh, of, of the world. It's simple as that. The fact that we have today... Uh, got a Indian origin prime minister, the most ethnically diverse cabinet in the history of mm -hmm. this country. But putting the race aside, it's what people bring to the table as individuals, as what they believe in and what they want to achieve for this country. But I, th I would argue that even more than that, look at the tapestry of the social fabric of this country and the way it's shaped. Uh, you know, people have been working in the Brit Britain's national interest for before we got Brexit done, mm. you know. Um, and those... So, so for, let's go back to the referendum, for example. Some of the biggest constituencies to vote leave were people that... Uh, uh, constituencies dominated by people of ethnic minority origins. Why is that? Because most of us believe in Britain's national interest. Exactly, and we, a lot of us worked very hard to get where we are, and we had to go through the correct channels to do it, so it's very annoying seeing people coming in via the boat and being given everything. Exactly. I mean, look, it's every single dinghiwara that crosses the channel illegally is a slap in the face of every single legal migrant who's jumped through endless hoops of the Home Office, Absolutely. the Foreign Office, the visa system, to make this country their home because they want to make this country That's their home right. for the right reasons. Um, let's be honest. You know, we do want want to attract the best and the brightest, but we also don't want to be attracting every single illegal dinghy well. No. And what about this Rwanda plan, then? Because, obviously, this was supposed to be a deterrent, but yet it's been scuppered by the Lords again, although the House of Commons don't really have to listen to the Lords. No, indeed not. But we are a democracy and we do believe in our... Well, they're unelected, though, so... They are elected, that, they're, but you know... they're still part of our democracy. But I would argue that we need to leave the ECHR. And that I would argue, going back to the Brexit referendum, we should have left the ECHR as part of getting Brexit done. 
because we still are being uh, dictated to by foreign courts. We shouldn't be. I mean, you have every yeah, left one. I'm going to stop you in the middle of that because sure. even though we have Brexited, we have not taken advantage of the benefits that Brexit would have brought us. So even if we then leave the ECHR, we'll just be outside another organisation where we're not taking the benefits of that either. Well, I would argue that, look, uh, we got Brexit done for three very simple reasons, to make Britain very global. Not, not globalist, but global to make Britain great again, that we need to be looking beyond uh, the European Union. Now, a big part of that is no longer being dictated to by foreign courts or foreign jurisdictions. Now, look, going back to Rwanda, uh, the Rwanda plan, when Prithi started it, talking about it, yes, it would have acted as a deterrent. Priti Patel. Priti Patel, as Home Secretary at the time. At this, at this minute, I'm not convinced it's going to act as a deterrent enough. Yeah. Uh, because mm. simply because we haven't been able to deport a single person on a plane yeah. to Rwanda. But also, we've embarrassed ourselves because we have given this free reign to people who, oh, all your appeals failed. Here's some more money to join our legal system and try again. Yeah, it's, no it's other absolutely do that. bonkers. It's, just it's absolutely, farcical. It's farcical and it needs to be dealt with. The Home Office, I would argue, is way too big for its shoes. It needs to be broken up. The, you know, I call it the great blob. And it acts against the interests of Home Secretary after Home Secretary after Home Secretary. Mm. Look at Prithi, look at Suella, and look at James now. He, they all have had to fight the great blob in the Home yeah. Office. It has to be broken up. But going back to Rwanda, I think we should be doing what the Australians were doing, mm. or as I argued in a speech in October last year, that we should be, yes, picking up every single uh, legal migrant in the middle of the channel, putting themselves in danger as a, as a one rule person, and dropping them not on the Kent coast yeah. in Dover, but t dropping them back in France. Well, I, I, I say we should have giant cruise ships around the perimeters and put them in the cruise ship. A lot of people pay for that. <laughs> Go on holiday. <laughs> But no, that's not being unkind. That's just saying you get processed there. So there's no... You don't come on to shore until you're processed. Once you're processed, then we determine Look, we, where you're going to go. Indeed, we've paid the French, I think, tens of millions of pounds for what? They, they have been unable to enforce law and order on their own shores. Mm. And I think it's about time that we went in and did it for them. And finally, Richard Sunak, can he survive? Because, Look. you know... Look, I, I, I've always been a conservative, and uh, the Labour Party simply don't have anything particular to offer. We still don't know what uh, Keir Starmer stands for. I mean, we know he's been a lawyer for everything that's wrong in the world, but what does he actually stand for? Well, he would say that he's been a lawyer to protect and, and, and do good things. Well, I mean, protecting... Uh, uh, well, yes, let's not go into the details. I mean, let's not go into <laughs> those details. I mean, Sadiq Khan is another one. I mean, he, he's another lawyer who's protected and defended some very questionable ideals and ideas. But that's what you get with the Labour Party. I mean, as far as Rishi is concerned, I think, look, he's trying to do a very uh, difficult job. Uh, but otherwise, let's look at the options which are in front of us. Uh, yes, Conservative votes are staying at home, and we need to give them far more to come out and vote for us. Mm, give them something to vote for, for goodness sake. Aman, uh, Aman, thank you very much for coming to see me. Lovely thank you, to talk thank to you very much, Nana. That is, of course, Aman Bogle. He has been my political spotlight. This is GB News. We are the People's Channel. Coming up, my amazing panel. Broadcast from columnist Lizzie Cundy. Also, former Labour Party advisor Matthew Larson will be joining me. But next, my monologue on the beautiful Princess of Wales, Princess Catherine. Uh, I'll leave you with some weather, but keep those messages coming. to ask GB views at gbnews.com or tweet us at GB. GB News will read your messages out, your messages for love and support to Princess Catherine. Stay tuned. That's on the way next. Do not go anywhere. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We're starting the weekend on a very showery note across the UK, quite a chilly northwesterly airstream too, but things do look brighter as we head into Sunday. Low pressure is anchored towards the northeast of the UK at the moment, feeding in that uh, brisk northwesterly airstream and plenty of showers around too. And we hold on to a very showery picture across the UK as we head into this evening. Still some heavy ones around with some hail and thunder in places. But notice as we go through the overnight period, the showers tend to become more focused towards northern and northwest facing areas. So some clear spells developing inland and towards the south and east of the UK. The winds just starting to ease down a touch too. But uh, temperatures generally holding up at 4 to 6 Celsius in towns and cities, but in rural spots down into low single figures where we could see a touch of frost by Sunday morning. 
As for Sunday itself, well, a brighter day in store across the bulk of the UK. Still a few showers towards the north and northwest. Lighter winds too tomorrow, and with more than a way of sunshine around, it should feel more pleasant out and about, with temperatures climbing to 10 to 13 Celsius. 13 down towards the south and southeast is 55 in Fahrenheit, which is close to the seasonal average for this time in March. As we head into Monday, though, we see more of an east-west split developing in the weather across the UK. Outbreaks of rain moving in across the west and southwest starting to turn quite heavy in places. Holding on to some sunshine towards the north and east, one or two wintry showers towards the far northeast of the UK. And as we head into the coming week, things will generally turn more unsettled, with temperatures close to the seasonal average, but rain never too far away. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Hello, good afternoon and welcome to GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir. Over the next two hours, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines right now. This show is all about opinion. It's mine, it's theirs and of course it's yours. We'll be debating, discussing and at times we will disagree, but no one will be cancelled. So joining me today is broadcaster and economist Lizzie Cundy and also former Labour Party advisor Matthew Laza. Before we get started, let's get your latest news headlines. Nana, thanks very much. Good afternoon from the newsroom. It's exactly four o'clock and a recap of the headlines this hour. First to Russia, where the president is continuing to link Ukraine to last night's attack in Moscow, which killed at least 133 people. 
The United States says it believes the attack was carried out by a branch of the Islamic State terror group known as ISIS-K. Kyiv have described Russia's apparent attempt to blame Ukraine as absolutely untenable and absurd. Neither Vladimir Putin nor the FSB have presented any proof of a link with Ukraine. Well, in an address to the nation, President Putin said it was an attack on the Russian people and vowed that justice would be served. All the executors, planners and those who ordered this crime will be rightfully and inevitably punished, whoever they are and whoever directed them. Let me repeat, we will identify and punish everyone who stood behind the terrorists who prepared this attack against Russia, against our people. Well, back here in the UK, cancer charities have praised the Princess of Wales for speaking out about her diagnosis, saying it will encourage others with concerns to visit their doctor. Kate says she and William have been doing everything possible to process and to manage the shock news privately for the sake of their young family. The King has described her as courageous for choosing to speak out publicly about her condition. It's after the future Queen revealed on Friday that she had begun a course of preventative chemotherapy last month. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family, but I've had a fantastic medical team who have taken great care of me, for which I'm so grateful. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful, However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. We've been speaking to people on the streets of Birmingham who sent their well wishes to the future Queen. It's got shocking, really. She's got young kids, she's got a family. I think that's probably the more upsetting thing about everything. The public eye and things doesn't really matter at the minute, does it? I think it was a brave decision and I think that will just uh, awaken people's minds to uh, how, how troublesome cancer is yeah. and to be checked out themselves. Yeah, it's very shocking really and obviously um, you know, it's one in two people are getting cancer now so I think we all should be a little bit more respectful and just let her get on with it and uh, you know, to recover with her family and just lay off her a little bit. You know, I think she had a lot of scrutiny over the last few weeks. In other news today, knife crime campaigner Richard Taylor has died at the age of 75. Mr Taylor's 10-year-old son, Damilola, was killed in 2000 in what became one of Britain's highest profile crimes. The devastating loss led Mr Taylor and his late wife, Gloria, to set up a trust aimed at supporting disadvantaged young people. He had said his son's death was the result of enormous problems in society, but that he wanted his legacy to be one of hope. Gareth Southgate says the controversy over the New England shirt is not high on his list of priorities as they face Brazil later. Nike's new kit has been criticised over what it's been described as a playful redesign of the St George's Cross, with the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak warning against messing with the national flag. But the FA has defended the changes, saying it's a tribute to the 1966 World Cup winning team. It's understood to be selling quickly, though, despite costing £125. And the England manager says the Three Lions crest is the most important thing on the shirt. More than 80 pubs, clubs and sports centres across the country will receive a funding boost to help keep their doors open. It's part of the government's levelling up programme, which aims to create jobs and to support communities. It will also see curtains rise once again at the Edinburgh Film House two years after it was forced to close. That follows a campaign backed by actors Ewan Bremner and Brian Cox. The independent cinema will get a funding boost worth around £1.5 million. And if you've ever wondered what happened to Agatha Christie's typewriter, well, mystery solved. It's set to go on display as part of the crime fiction exhibition at Cambridge University Library. Her dictaphone will also be part of the show, along with the typescript for her final novel, featuring the famed detective Hercule Poirot. Murder by the Book, which opens today, explores Britain's fondness for fictional sleuths from Sherlock Holmes to Jane Tennyson and Inspector Morse. Those are the headlines. More in the next half hour. In the meantime, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the QR code there on your screen. Or if you're listening on radio, you can visit our website, gbnews.com alerts.
Thank you, Sam. Good afternoon and welcome on board. It's just coming up to six minutes after four o'clock. I'm Nana Akwe. This is GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. What an incredible couple. Prince William and Princess Catherine. I don't even know them, but I love them. Watching them together is like watching the Queen and Prince Philip and indeed Charles and Camilla. True love. No sniping at the sidelines at other couples like you know who. No vendettas to settle. No attempts to destroy. No attempts to hog the PR limelight. None of that. Just love. Love for each other and love for king and country. Well, now what an incredible man Prince William has turned out to be. He's passionate about his role as future king. He has carried out his duties admirably and under immense pressure whilst looking after his wife and family, setting an exceptional example to other men. And Princess Catherine, a doting mother and kind soul. She oozes beauty and effortless compassion. You can see it a mile off. I've never heard anyone who has met her say anything but nice things about her. Yesterday, she bravely ended speculation of her diagnosis. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. So messages of love have been flooding in from leaders all over the world. Joe Biden, whose son Beau died of brain cancer, was one of the first. Both he and his wife Jill have led an initiative to make cancer a thing of the past. In a statement, the king, who is also currently undergoing cancer treatment himself, said he is so proud of Catherine for her courage in speaking as she did and remains in the closest contact with his beloved daughter-in-law. Even the Sussexes reached out offering health and healing. I feel so sad for Catherine, but I know that she is having the best of care, as she should, and is surrounded by love. She's an incredible mother, and she's our future queen. Harry and Meghan, take note. Instead of putting your families under immense stress because you are angry, grow up, stop whinging, and perhaps try and fix some of the damage and mental anguish you've caused. And Meghan, for God's sake, go and see your dad. There's nothing attractive about an unforgiving hypocrite. You have both come across as heartless, and in my view, your behaviour has been ugly. It's not too late, though, to clean up some of the mess you have made, but I suspect it is too late to win back the hearts and minds of the British people, and indeed many around the world. Catherine is our brave queen in waiting, and we wish her nothing but health and love. Get well soon. So before we get stuck into the debate, here's what else is coming up today. For the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking, should corporations leave our flag alone? As politicians and public figures queue up to condemn Nike's new England kit, should this be a wake-up call to virtue signalling companies? Then at 4.50, it's Royal Roundup time. Angela Levin will be here with the latest from behind the palace walls. On the menu, we'll be reflecting on the news of the Princess of Wales' cancer diagnosis. And as ever, don't forget to get in touch and send your well wishes to Princess Kate to gbviews at gbnews.com or tweet us at gbnews. Then at five, it's this week's difficult conversation. Ryan Mark will be live in the studio as he addresses the terrifying epidemic of drink spiking sweeping the nation. Uh, that's coming up in the next hour. Tell me what you think on everything we're discussing. Email gbviews at gbnews.com or tweet me at gbnews. Right, let's get started. Let's welcome again to my panel, broadcaster and columnist Lizzie Cundy and also former Labour Party advisor Matthew Laza. Hello. I'm going to start with you, Lizzie Cundy. It's so sad, isn't it, to hear of Catherine's yeah. diagnosis? Terrible. I mean, I, I was on the way to the Inspirational Women Awards mm. where we met um, mm. last night and uh, we were listening in the radio and the, and the cabbie actually afterwards said, can I pull over? Oh, oh, and he was in tears. He had tears oh. streaming down his mm. face. And I have to say the, the impact of this mm. news has had 
on everyone, not just in this country, but globally. Yeah. And how loved Catherine is, and she certainly has got the love, not just of this nation, of the whole world mm. behind her. But what's sad news, and it just goes to show, cancer can is a real level, leveler. It can, it can strike at any time, yeah. any age, to anyone, even our royals. And um, what's sad news, but, you know, my, my, my heart goes to William. I mean, oh. who has... And those children. Those mm. poor children having to tell the children this sad news. And William has gone about his business with the, with the world on his shoulders. Yeah. And, you know, I know he's born into this, you know, whole tradition to, and he's going to be our future king. But at the moment, you know, his wife comes first. What dignity, though, absolute dignity that he's shown. Mm. Really lovely man. Uh, absolutely, I think that they've both been incredibly dignified. And the people who haven't, of course, are all those internet trolls uh, who, over mm. the last few weeks, have been saying such horrible things. And you know, I thought I think... you were going to say someone. I know. Well, you know, I, I, I'll let, leave let's that to. Let's not talk yes. about them. No, no, let's not talk about them. Absolutely. But all those people who've been speculating and sort of, you know, um, uh, because they think it's fun. Um, you know, this is a human being a very, in, a, at a very mm. difficult time for her uh, and her family, as well as all those who care for her. So I just hope the one thing that comes out of this is everybody who sort of, you know. Know, picks up their phone and you know, thinks it's funny to tweet something not very pleasant. Just reminds themselves that yeah. um, actually, you know, uh, uh, that you know that they should uh, think twice and that real people have real feelings. As does the country about the person they care very much about. Well, I never even got it. I didn't understand why there was a big speculation about the photograph and everything. I thought, leave her alone for God's well, sake. Well, all the silly things about I you know, she's still with, you know, it, for me, she's still with us, still she on the moon. I mean, it's just daft. But some of them are pretty offensive, weren't I know, they? And, and you know what, Catherine, she she just showed her her strength and her dignity, yeah. going through all of this and then having to do a video. Mm. To yeah. stop all the rumours yeah. and, and her, her whole family, you know, having to watch her do that. Mm. I, I salute her. She's yeah. amazing. Mm. And, uh, you know, we're all behind her and with her and supporting her in every way. Yeah. And, and, and as I said in my monologue, note to Harry and Meghan that, yes, I'm glad that they've reached out. But I would say to Meghan mm. to go and reach out for her to Absolutely. her father. Absolutely. Because... This is not a good look. If you really mean, e even if she goes with the family and to, to see Catherine and they all reunite and everything, there's still a level, a disingenuous look where you're prepared to do that for others, but not your own father. So I, you know, I, I would say that if, if you want to fix a lot of the PR damage, Megan, I would go and well, I think see it's your not dad. just the PR damage, is it? It's also Part the emotional it, damage. Though. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, you know, it should just be a reminder uh, to Megan, it's just a reminder to us all of the of the fragility of all of us. Uh, you know, and we hope, and uh, you know, it looks like Catherine's going to be OK after her mm. treatment and we all wish her well. But it's just a reminder that, you know, anything can happen to any of us at any time and therefore it's always good to reach out well, to those, is... even if you've got some issues with, that those who fundamentally you love. And I, and I, don't, look, I don't want to talk about Meghan no, at all, but I think now is the time maybe that her and Harry should really look at themselves and maybe do a public apology to Kate to, for the mean, awful things they have said, they have written done in books, interviews about this poor girl. Yeah, and, terrible. And I think it's now to say public, publicly for everyone to hear, we are sorry, we were wrong, and then they can move on, because this just shows how precious Well, we certainly is. don't need any more briefings like the ones we had after the photograph saying it wouldn't have happened here well, from uh, Montecito. <laughs> well, I even sort of slightly, um, even in their message where they said privacy, and I felt that there was a dig in their message even with the word privacy as if they hadn't been given it. That's just my take on it. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure some of the viewers... Dignif might... I think that what they need to do is just show just, dignity they, in they, silence. It just feels that there's always a dig. There's always, there's yeah. always a dig in dignity. They, they need, there's I, a dig in dignity every absolutely. time. Absolutely. And I'm sure, you know, as human beings, they, they're feel for Catherine like the, like the rest of us, but they need to stop their PR machine, mm. um, uh, you know, even by uh, implication, uh, being in any way sort of snide and... Uh, yeah, because and there's always... There's always there's even in there, there's always these little yeah. digs. There's always these little digs, and then, sadly, you get the trolls that follow on from all of this. Mm. And let's not forget that William also lost his mother. Exactly. William yeah. has got his father, who was also suffering Absolutely. from cancer. He lost his grandmother. There is so much that William is going through, mm. and as someone that I know who, you know, whose partner had cancer, you feel terribly helpless. You, 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 it's the worst feeling in the world to see someone you love going through this. And, of course, he must be petrified that, you know, he went through losing his mother mm. at a very young age. Yeah. He will be petrified, you know. I, I pray that Kate will be Absolutely, fine. Absolutely, and thankfully all fine. the signals. And the key thing, I think, Nana, is, is the, uh, as, the, as the coming weeks, we hope it's sort of weeks and not many months, but we hope she gets better as quickly as possible, but, but treatment yeah. takes time. Um, um, and 
therefore we hope that the endless speculation, you know, uh, must stop. People must just give her and the family time uh, for her to receive the treatment and hopefully uh, make a full recovery. Yeah. So it's all about all of us just just realising that they're human beings and that, they, they, that we need to show dignity as, as a people by giving them time uh, yeah. for the very necessary treatment. And, yeah. and as we know, st stress is a killer in itself. Absolutely. And we need to give her time to heal. Totally. And I really do hope that Meghan and Harry do the right thing and give a public apology to Kate. Yeah. I think that's really necessary and we all wish Kate all the best totally. and all our love. Yeah, well, there you have it. We'll keep your uh, messages of support coming in as well. GB Views at GBNews.com or tweet us at GB News. This is GB News. We are the People's Channel. I'm Nana Aquea. We're live on TV, online and on digital radio. Still to come, Royal Roundup time. And John Levin will be here live to give us the latest from behind the palace walls. On the menu, as ever, obviously, what's happening with Princess Catherine. Uh, stay tuned. Keep those messages coming. But next, it's time for the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, should corporations leave our flag alone? I've got a poll up right now asking you that. That's on X. Uh, what do you think? Should corporations leave our flag alone? Send me your thoughts. Email gbviews at gbnews.com or tweet me at gbnews. Cast your vote now. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6am. New rules are going to give staff at NHS England paid leave if they suffer a miscarriage. Yeah, any of the NHS England staff who miscarry in the first 24 weeks of pregnancy will be able to take 10 days paid leave. Their partners can take five. Well, we're lucky enough right now to be able to speak exclusively to the founder of George's Law and national baby loss campaigner, Keely Langthorne. A very good morning to you, Keely. First of all, um, it's called George's Law because it is a, a major step forward and that's one of your son's names, isn't it? Yes, it is, and yes. Um, I lost my son, unfortunately, George, um, two years ago. Um, he was still born at, at 23 weeks. Um, I was flabbergasted after having George to know that I was required by law to return straight back to work the next day. So under current legislation in the UK, if you give birth to a baby under 24 weeks, the law says you should be going back to work the next day. So, for instance, I left George at the mortuary on a Thursday evening, had a midwife coming to stop my milk on a Friday, but the law says I should be in work the next day. Such an archaic way of, of working now, and I don't know why we are not following the New Zealand model and changing law and allowing employees three days paid leave. So under legislation in New Zealand, all employees get three days paid leave in the event of a miscarriage under 24 weeks. And it, it is... It is so um, brilliant to see the NHS sort of taking a stance. They're the UK's biggest employer, 1.7 million employees. And they're, let's face it, they're on their knees in terms of financial hardship. But if, if, the, if the NHS can do this, I don't know why others can't. Yeah, and um, you make the interesting point as well that uh, although it is now there for NHS workers, they may have to face sending home bereaved parents who haven't got that right. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
Yeah. Good afternoon, yeah. welcome on board. It's just gone 20 minutes after four o'clock. This is GB News, don't forget as well, you can watch the show live on YouTube. I'm Nana Aquir, and it's time now for the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, should corporations leave our flag alone? Nike's decision, or Nike, is it Nike or Nike? I'll go with bikey, bike, bike, Nike's. Nike's decision to redesign the Cross of St George on England's new kit for the upcoming Euro 2024 tournament by adding purple and blue horizontal stripes has continued to cause uproar, with even Rishi Sunak weighing in. I actually was quite impressed that Keir Starmer weighed in. This is the most passionate I've ever seen him about anything. The Prime Minister said simply that we shouldn't mess with national flags. And now England manager Gareth Southgate has given his thoughts on the change too, saying that the new design was clearly not the Cross of St George, and Nike's reasoning behind it, it was lost on him. However, Nike have sought to defend themselves by saying it was never their intention to offend anyone, and they simply wanted to celebrate the heroes of 1966 and their achievements with a playful new design. Uh, that's code for we wanted to get maximum PR and sell as much as we could. Both Nike and the FA have also stressed that there are no plans to adjust the kit between now and Euro 2024. So, for the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking, should corporations leave our flag alone? Right, so um, let's see who we got live. Uh, before we do that, though, let's go live to presenter Ben Leo, who's there in Wembley. All right, Ben, what a go on. What, what, is anybody, what are people saying about this purple and what colour is it, pink flag? Yeah, purple, blue, pink. Uh, yeah, good uh, afternoon from a very crisp and cold Wembley. I should have bought my coat. Do you know what? Most people have said it's much to do about nothing, if I'm honest. They said they don't really care. There's been a few people who have said, you know, leave the flag alone, not least, of course, Gareth Southgate last night. And isn't it funny? It's the only issue of the year which has united all the political parties. Richie Sunak, Keir Starmer, even the Lib Dems all saying that Nike should uh, go back to the drawing board and re-release the kit with a proper flag on the back. They released a statement last night saying they weren't going to do that. And the game against Brazil at Wembley behind me tonight will be the first time that the senior team wears the flag. Interestingly, Harvey Elliott, who's a, a young Liverpool star, he was playing for the under-21s last night. He uh, put his collar up. He popped his collar so that the St George's flag, or the lack of it, was disguised. Whether that was intentional or not, I don't know. I'm joined by a couple of England fans with me now. We've got Martin and his little boy Samuel, is that right? Oliver, Oliver. sorry. <laughs> I knew I'd get that wrong. I told you, didn't I? Yeah. What do you think about the flag? Is it much, uh, much a fuss about nothing or should they have just left it alone? Um, to be honest, I think like uh, it's probably a little bit disrespectful to like all the die-hard England fans. Like, they've, um, it probably means quite a lot to them. Uh, and probably Nike have just done it for them like a, um, a perspective of trying to bring everyone togetherness, do you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, it's probably a bit disrespectful, like, but I think they should probably go back to it and probably keep everyone a bit happier. <laughs> well, you were saying to me off air that actually the bigger concern was the price of the shirt. Yeah, yeah, I think it's £125 for the new shirt. Uh, it's probably costing, like, the normal, like, family man out of it. Do you know what I mean? If I was to buy one and bought one for Oliver, it's going to be, like, over £200. So I don't think it's... I don't think they're trying to catch the right sort of people with that sort of price. And this is your first England game, am I right, yeah, both yeah, of you? So my first England game and Oliver's first England game as well. Oliver, what do you reckon the score's going to be? 1-0 uh, to England. Yeah, 1-0. Well, who's going to score? Uh, Rashford. Rashford. Is he starting tonight? Because uh, Bayaka Saka's out. He's arguably... I'm an Arsenal fan, so I'm going to say he's our, our best player. But Saka's out and Neymar's out for the Brazilians as well. Yeah, I think... Um, uh, I think Saka, obviously Saka's out, so I think I think they'll probably play Foden on the right and um, Southgate is pretty predictable, so he'll probably play Rashford on the left. Good stuff. Look, look have a great day. Uh, fantastic to speak with you. And Nana, actually, do you know what? I know there's been a lot of furore about this, but as soon as the whistle goes tonight and the game kicks off, I don't think many England fans will be thinking about what's on the back of the shirt. No, maybe not. Well, they'll be looking at what's in the back of the net. Thank you very much, Ben Leo. Really good to talk to you. Enjoy. <laughs> so nobody really cares. I care. But what do you think? So uh, joining me to discuss this, uh, I've got uh, former Labour MP Dennis McShane and trade unionist and broadcaster Paul Embry. Right, I'm going to start with you. Dennis McShane, is it all much ado about nothing? Well, I have to say, when I heard Keir Starmer and Rishi and somebody say the Lib Dems, Ed Davies, now a football fan, 
I was a bit bewildered. We've got no cops on the streets. The NHS is meltdown. You, you know the list better than I do, <laughs> Nana. And we're talking about a tiny little thing which you have to get a micro or magnifying glass out to find on a shirt. I mean, it's not even the English flag. I'm just holding that up. Just draw, draw it. it. No, well, I, I don't know if you can. The English flag is a not square. Perfect. It stems from the battlefield and it's got a cross that fills yeah. the square. This thing is a long, traversal, horizontal line and a much smaller vertical one. So I... Oh, let's like, put it back up, Dennis. I, I, we just I, literally I, got the camera I'm on it. I'm so it. sorry. I'm lower. Here we are, here oh, we are. Oh, so you, so you keep your hands still, Wilma. Right. Try to make the point. The flag of St George has, since yeah, medieval you, times, yeah, been a simple yeah. square and an absolutely square cross inside it. This fella is a long traversal and a very short going up and down line. I'm glad uh, we, we did that. And let's, on, let's honestly, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 just, but, but, I mean, I love it. That's, that's England. I mean, we make a fuss about anything and nothing. All right, Paul, Paul Embry, what do you think about this? Well, I, I'm not terribly exercised about it, but I do understand why people might be, because the truth is, Nana, we are living through a period in this country where, if you like, the, the liberal and cultural elites are taking any opportunity they can to trash the traditions of the country, to trash the history of the country. We see it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people, when they see stuff like this, um, they are instinctively defensive. And when they see a big corporation like Nike, which is well known for, you know, flaunting its woke credentials mm. and pushing diversity as much as it can down people's throats, when they see Nike interfering with the national flag in this way, particularly when, and it is true that these uh, colours are very similar to the, to the trans colours. Now, I'm not suggesting that there is... Uh, a deliberate ploy on the part of Nike uh, in that regard. But I think people are probably right to be a little bit suspicious about the whole thing. Look, I'm willing to give Nike the benefit of the doubt on this occasion. They say that the, the colours are a tribute to the training kit of the players in 1966 with the blue and the, the purple. Yeah. Uh, and that, that may be true, but I do think it was silly. I think it's a silly move rather than a sinister move. And if you united all of the main parties, political parties against you, you've probably done something wrong. Mm. You see, I, I don't believe that, you know, the tribute to whatever, whatever, because I distinctly remember Dylan Mulvaney, which I'm pretty sure was Nike, and she, he, I almost said she, he, because they've almost done it to me now, he was promoting sports bras for women. OK, so uh, for me, it feels like there is yes okay they may say that it's to you know commemorate the the players but I, d I don't really believe that at all I just feel that there's more of another issue maybe I'm turning into one of those what are the what do you call those people not the, the people who make up stuff and then um Conspiracy theories. Yeah, oh, conspiracy maybe I'm turning theories. into one of those. Conspiracy but but theories. it is a bit close, isn't it? Dennis was saying, am I, am, I, am I turning into a conspiracy theorist with this? No, not at all. It's, it's, it's great fun. I mean, Paul's a very young man, very fluid, active young man, but I'm old enough to have watched the 1966 World Cup. You remember, that's the last time we won something. Mm. And the English team ran out in the colours of Wales, red. I thought, what's going on? Because the Germans wore white. Mm. And, well, perhaps we were being polite to the Germans, having beaten them in the war. And let, we let that, that colour go first. So be a bit serious. The worrying thing for me is, England, out of its old imperial nostalgia, gives itself the right to put four different national teams, <laughs> or Britain does, uh, into these tournaments. No other country does. France could Germany. There were two Germanys, when, mm. again, when I was young. Why don't they have two teams? And I'd be they a do. bit nervous they before making a huge fuss do. about that. They, do. they, 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 they used do. to. They, they did. Before the no, fall before, of the Berlin Wall, there was before, East Germany the point, and the point, the point is, Paul, that France also incorporated Algeria and Tunisia. Now, we ought to be careful until somebody seriously asks us, why have you got the right to four teams of British players in these tournaments and we've only got the uh, right to one? But this has one. got nothing to do with the flag, though. No, no, Well, no. then, that's what we're talking about. So we're talking but the, about flag the flag itself, you remember, Paul will remember, because <laughs> no, uh, no. he's very sound on this, when it was... No. 20 years ago, it was the BMP and the National Front yeah, but, but and that, the English Defence well, we League back, carried. Though. Thank yeah. God we did. Well, we took the flag back. Uh, we didn't allow these people to weaponise it. And that's in the same vein, should we be allowing uh, companies like Nike to make money out of it? Because that's what they're doing. They're making political capital and PR out of us talking about it, whilst also manipulating our flag and to make it not resemble our flag. 
That's just well, absurd. I, I think I think look, the lesson is if you're a big corporation and you've got the contract to do something like this, don't interfere with the national flag. Yeah. That's the key thing because you will run the risk of getting blowback, as Nike have done on this occasion. I think actually, probably in many respects, Anna, the more important point was the point that the the gentleman who was being interviewed by Ben outside Wembley Stadium a few minutes ago made, which was in terms of the price, the money mm. that Nike are making from these kits. It's an absolute racket. The cheapest uh, shirt, this shirt, the yeah, cheapest. Yeah get for a child for a standard shirt is 65 pounds now mm. i think I that actually uh, is a scandal it's a racket and it goes to the heart of the question of whether football is a working class game anymore i remember years ago i'm a wolves fan i used to get the wolves kit each year and it didn't cost very much at all when you've got parents paying at least 65 quid and sometimes more for, for the you know the higher quality versions of the shirt mm. uh, you have to ask that question whether it's a game for working class people but i paul, think that is a, 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 paul as a grandfather I can assure you uh, that Lidl has very good English shirts for kids, and not quite the posh ones, but of course Lidl is a German-owned firm, so yeah, they're but... serving up the English uh, yeah, flag. Yeah, but obviously... But also, look, my flag is the British flag, the Union Jack. I was born in Scotland, part Irish family, uh, okay, so no, no, I'm, Dennis, I'm, I'm not sure the flag I'm, of St George speaks for me. I'm going to stop me. you there. I'm going to stop you there, because we're running out of time, not because I didn't want to hear one of your tirades about when you were young. How much time have we got? Not that long. <laughs> but, yeah, should, should companies be manipulating this flag. I don't think actually corporations should be allowed to if they're using a national flag. I think they should be paying licensing money to actually use the flag anyway. I don't think they should be allowed to manipulate it. Paul Embry, thank you so much. Also, Dennis McShane, good to talk to you. Thank you so much. Right, coming up to 32 minutes after 4 o'clock, I'm Nana Aquir. We are live here on GB News. Coming up, we'll continue with the Great British debate this hour. And I'm asking, should corporations leave our flag alone? You'll hear the thoughts of my panel broadcast from columnist Lizzie Cundy, plus a former Labour Party advisor and Matthew Laza. Still to come, this week's difficult conversation. My guest will be talking about the recent epidemic of drink spiking. Ryan Mark, who had his own his drink spiked. But first, let's get your latest news headlines. Good afternoon from the newsroom 432 and first in an update on the scenes in Russia where the president is continuing to link Ukraine to last night's attack on a concert hall in Moscow where 143 people are now known to have been killed. The United States has strongly condemned the attack that the US intelligence services believe was carried out by a branch of the Islamic State terror group. Meanwhile, Kyiv has described Russia's attempt to blame Ukraine as absolutely untenable and absurd. Neither Vladimir Putin nor the FSB have presented any proof of that link. In a statement to the nation, though, President Putin said the terrorists can expect punishment and condemned what he called the barbaric attack. Cancer charities in the UK have praised the Princess of Wales for speaking about her diagnosis, saying it will encourage others with concerns to visit their doctor. Kate said she and William have been doing everything possible to process and to manage the shock news privately for the sake of their young family. The King has called her courageous for choosing to speak out publicly about her condition. Knife crime campaigner Richard Taylor has died today at the age of 75 after a long battle with prostate cancer. His 10-year-old son, Damilola, was killed in 2000 in what became one of Britain's highest profile crimes. The devastating loss led Mr Taylor and his late wife Gloria to set up a trust aimed at supporting disadvantaged young people. He said his son's death was the result of enormous problems in society, but that he wanted his legacy to be one of hope. And more than 80 pubs, clubs and sports centres across the country will receive a funding boost to help keep their doors open. It's part of the government's levelling up programme, which aims to create jobs and to support communities. It will also see curtains rise once again at the Edinburgh Film House two years after it was forced to close. Following a campaign backed by actors Ewan Bremner and Brian Cox, the independent cinema will get a funding boost worth around £1.5 million. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Dubes & Co. Weekdays from 6pm. 
you think this country needs new gas power stations, apparently this will all be about trying to get some form of energy security. Rishi Sunak has upset people today with this suggestion, people saying that actually this would do more damage to climate change uh, than it would do good. Where are you on it, Richard? Uh, I'll tell you exactly where we need a lot more gas power stations and nuclear power stations because quite often the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Last week, we imported 16% of all our electricity because we haven't got enough capacity in the UK and we're now totally over-reliant on renewables. Um, the part of the problem is the lack of storage capacity, which mm. the government has finally got round to addressing. I think this as backup is actually quite a sensible idea. But they are not doing anything, as far as I can tell. At the moment, it will be retrofitted to have storage capability, which seems to be utterly bonkers. I mean, anyone who's got solar panels, um, you know, you know very well you're storing up energy. So it's about storage as much as production. And they could have gone, you know, 20 years ago, we could have had nuclear power. You know, we, we could have done more. We haven't looked far enough ahead in the future and we are in grave danger of making the same mistake. I mean, the other side of this is what is the difference going to be? Blackouts are, you know, they're irritating and... Irritating? It'd be disastrous well, if it would destroy our now. economy. Well, they would be now, but, you know, um, some of us remember three-day weeks and things like that. And, in fact, you know, I grew up thinking that everybody had, you know, at least a couple of days a week when they had to eat off a of prime estate and things. This is, again, I don't want to harp on, but this is one of the problems in the politics in our country, isn't it? So many politicians, they just think in election cycles, Absolutely. they just think, what can I do and yeah. say to get my own backside re-elected uh, at the next general election? They're not always looking ahead. Uh, actually, politics aside, what is genuinely the best thing for this country? GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello, good afternoon. If you just tuned in, where have you been? It's just coming up to 38 minutes after four o'clock. This is GB News on TV online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir. And it's time now for the great British debate this hour. And I'm asking, should corporations leave our flag alone? Nike's decision to redesign the Cross of St George on England's new kit for the upcoming Euro 2024 tournament by adding purple and blue, horizontal stripes, which uh, has... Uh, well, it just doesn't look like the flag has caused lots of uproar, and uh, even Rishi Sunak has weighed in, as well as Keir Starmer, which, to be honest, is the most animated I'd ever sort of seen him. <laughs> he was him. first. Keir Starmer was first. Yeah, I know. He, he got in there yeah. first. Yeah, it was terrible. Yeah. Oh, Lizzie, you cynic. And now, the Prime Minister said simply that we shouldn't mess with national flags. I agree. And now England manager Gareth Southgate has given his thoughts on the change, too. He said that the new design was clearly not the Cross of St George, and Nike's reasoning behind it was lost on him. However, Nike has sought to defend themselves by saying it was never their intention to offend anyone and they simply wanted to celebrate the heroes in 1966 and their achievements with a playful new design. Rubbish. It's all about <laughs> PR, isn't it? It really is. Uh, they said that there's no plans there. They're not going to change it, by the way. So for the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking, should corporations just leave our flag alone? Well, let's see what my panel make of that. I'm joined by broadcaster and columnist Lizzie Cundy, also former Labour Party advisor Matthew Laza. Matthew, seeing as your great leader spoke Sp first, first... I get to... Uh, you get to speak I'm not telling him to speak more often. I get, um, I've never no, seen him so excited, though. Seriously, well, he's a very passionate uh, football fan. I mean, you know, some, uh, as Dennis was saying, some politicians... Of all, of all parties, kind of uh, feel they have to pretend to be mm. football fans, even if it's not their thing, which I think is the worst thing ever. I work for Ed Miliband, who is actually quite into sport, but he's not into football. He's into baseball and snooker 
and various mm. other things, mm. but football's not his big thing. So, look, I think Keir was absolutely right. I think the Prime Minister was absolutely right. It's completely daft, isn't it? I mean, it's uh, it, I mean, it's not even as though it's been changed for the pride flag for a particular reason or something. It's just been changed for a sort of rather naff design well, it's of, a... no, of, no, of no particular but doesn't it, purpose. Doesn't it feel purport. a bit rainbow flaggy to you? It's, it's a little bit. But I just, I'm just Lizzie gonna... Carney, oh. let's go to Lizzie. No, I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely appalled at this. Mm. And Bobby Moore, who was the World Cup... 1966 football legend mm. would be turning in his grave. It's nothing sacred anymore. Mm. Let me just tell you a bit about Nike, who are American brand, by the way. This is all about trying to make money mm. and woke, and it is political. And let me tell you, Nike have no soul. They don't care. They don't care about football. They don't care about this country. And they certainly don't care about the football fans. I'm demanding that the FA literally takes this away from Nike and gives it to a British brand. Mm. I think it's disgusting. It's taking away our heritage. Well, well Nike would say that they are doing this to uh, garnish PR and people to be talking about it, and they do care. But at 125 quid a pop-up... Well, that's the thing. But it, it seems to be... I mean, the PR's backfiring, because just while we've uh, been mm. on air, um, uh, the Telegraph sports... Uh, the Telegraph newspaper sports desk has revealed that the FA are going to introduce a much tougher uh, uh, um, checking regime, um, a new vetting process, well, that's the posh well, word. Well, that's what I think. So, so um, it, it, they, they've told Telegraph Sport that they're going to uh, urge an overhaul of how England strips are approved in future, um, particularly because they're worried that Nike, as Nike have said, they will be messing with the strip again yeah. for the tournament. Well, also, so, uh, I, I, it looks like the FA are going to do something. But, but Nike were the now. ones who had Dylan Mulvaney. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, that was a, uh, a man dressed as a woman wearing a, uh, promoting a woman's sports bra. I don't think that ultimately added to their sales. Well, well but that, the point is I'm saying they have an agenda, and this it, is almost rainbow flagging. This is what I'm saying. This is a political move. Mm. It's a woke move, and it's causing diversity. And I hope all the players mm. that are, that are at, that playing against Brazil tonight, like Harvey Elliott did, put their collars up so this flag is hidden, yeah. and I hope they do that. I think it's disgusting, and it's changing that the flag is stripping us of our whole heritage. And, and some we, that unites us all. You know, football is the great... Absolutely. Well, well, listen, it's all united the politicians, so because it unites us they all. Think. Let's see what they think, because this shows nothing without you. And your views, let's welcome our great British voice on the show, their opportunity to tell us what they think about the topics we're discussing. Where should we go to? Where should we go? Do we have a map, I wonder? No, no, I prefer talking. When I got a... Is there a map? No, oh. ma'am! Oh, for <laughs> God's <laughs> sake! Sorry, Lee Somebody's Harris. head will roll. Yeah, that's But there it. is a flag! There is a flag. He's got a flag behind him. Lee Harris in Bristol, what, what are your thoughts on this? Oh, I can't hear you. Is he talking? Can you hear me? Oh, I can now, yeah. It's always the way oh, when okay. they say, can you hear me? You can always hear that bit. Go on, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> of course they should leave it alone, Nana. You know, it's disrespectful and political wokery, in my view, has no place in sport. I'm fed up with it. I actually don't blame the virtue signaling idiots at Nike completely. As I understand it, the FA actually signed off on it. Yeah. So they're ultimately responsible. You know, they should have seen this woke, politicised rubbish uh, from Nike and asked them to change it back. And if they don't change it back, I hope the sales of these shirts fail miserably. Why, why would you want to, you know, why would you want to wear, pay a ludicrous 125, 125 quid? That's insane for an England shirt. That, it, that has this kind of woke abomination on it. Um, I sincerely hope this is another case of go woke, go broke. Uh, you know, and when I said, uh, when I saw the statement from Nike saying it was a playful update and to celebrate mm. the heroes of 1966, probably like most people, I just thought that was gaslighting nonsense. It doesn't look anything like the kit from 1966. No. But it does, however, uh, I'm not going to play into the conspiracy theory too much, Nana, uh, but it does have a look like certain other flags. Funny that, isn't it's a it? A rainbow flag. Uh, yeah. yeah, but, you know, slightly different note on this. When I was um, a lot younger, Nana, and a lot fitter, I was lucky enough to represent South West England playing ice hockey all around the world. And standing for the national anthem while you're wearing that flag mm. on your shirt yeah. is a huge honour. And it's why I'm, partly why I'm so patriotic. And, and it was instilled in me in a young age. You know, these players are representing their country and being picked for England brings a huge amount of pride. Yeah. And it is dominantly symbolised by the St George's Cross. And I can say that because I have worn it on a shirt representing my country. And it you see that flag and you just yeah. think to yourself, you know, this is this is it. You know, this is brilliant. Listen, Lee, we're running out of time because I've got Angela Levin hot on my heels.
If I don't get you off oh, now, Oh, Angela can wait. No, no, I, she I, can't. I love Angela. She, no, we do. No, I'm afraid you've got to go, she... Lee Harris. Thank you so much for that. Really good to talk to you. I'm not risking it. I'm not risking it. No, don't. <laughs> no, <laughs> <I'm> not risking... <laughs> <laughs> she made me small. But I'll tell you what. Listen, uh, this is GV News on TV, online and on digital radio. Thank you so much, Lee Harris, my great British voice. Uh, still to come, is it time to pull the plug on Rwanda? We'll be discussing that in the great British voice in the next hour. <laughs> but next, Angela Levin will be joining us live for our weekly Royal Roundup. Do not go anywhere. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We're starting the weekend on a very showery note across the UK, quite a chilly northwesterly airstream too, but things do look brighter as we head into Sunday. The low pressure is anchored towards the northeast of the UK at the moment, feeding in that uh, brisk northwesterly airstream and plenty of showers around too. And we hold on to a very showery picture across the UK as we head into this evening. Still some heavy ones around with some hail and thunder in places. But notice as we go through the overnight period, the showers tend to become more focused towards northern and northwest facing areas. So some clear spells developing inland and towards the south and east of the UK. The winds just starting to ease down a touch too. But uh, temperatures generally holding up at four to six Celsius in towns and cities, but in rural spots down into low single figures where we could see a touch of frost by Sunday morning. As for Sunday itself, well, a brighter day in store across the bulk of the UK. Still a few showers towards the north and northwest. Lighter winds too tomorrow, and with more than a way of sunshine around, it should feel more pleasant out and about, with temperatures climbing to 10 to 13 Celsius. 13 down towards the south and southeast is 55 in Fahrenheit, which is close to the seasonal average for this time in March. As we head into Monday, though, we see more of an east-west split developing in the weather across the UK. Outbreaks of rain moving in across the west and southwest, starting to turn quite heavy in places. Holding on to some sunshine towards the north and east, one or two wintry showers towards the far northeast of the UK. And as we head into the coming week, things will generally turn more unsettled, with temperatures close to the seasonal average, but rain never too far away. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Uh, welcome to GB News. We're live on TV, online and on digital radio. Well, there's always something going on in the royal household and this week has been no different. In fact, it's been a very difficult week for the royal family. Uh, and who better to give us a, a rundown on it than Angela Levin, royal biographer. Angela Levin. Well, I mean, I heard you on Michelle Dubris' show yesterday talking about the news. And I was crying. Yeah, you were. I couldn't stop. I just thought that she was the most remarkable woman. I'm going to start crying. She is the most remarkable woman. Because when she was had this terrible news that she's got cancer and she's now talking to us, she's talking about everybody else, mm. really, just a little bit about herself. She's talking about she wanted to wait so that each child she could talk to so oh. that they would get, understand it in their own way. And there's a big difference between a little boy who's five as Louis mm. and and um, George, who is who is ten, and Charlotte, who seems extremely intelligent. So she wanted to do that, and she said at the end, um, you know, people who have it, that you are not alone, and you know. 
don't feel too bad, you are not alone. And I thought, here's this woman who's the very opposite of a me, me, me type of mm -hmm. person and wants to help everyone else, even though she herself is in a very difficult position. And I thought, you know, she's 42. She's been beautiful. She's been very athletic and she's been a marvellous princess, not put a foot wrong as everybody says about her. Um, and, and yet she had this dreadful um, decision of what to do about her own person, that whether she should say, whether she should speak it, whether she should fight back to all the people who'd been so cruel or what. And very bravely, mm. she decided to speak on her own. She hadn't liked making speeches. Her and Camilla don't like making speeches. It's quite understandable why. It's very, very difficult. People henpick all the sorts of things. But uh, Shelley wanted to do that by herself, all alone, uh, and say that. But also be very positive, you know, I feel well, I'm going to get better, but I have to look after myself. I realise that too. In other words, um, you know, she, she's somebody who doesn't put herself first. She put herself way down because she wants everyone else to be um, happy and fulfilled. And all her work with young children, because she knows that affects the whole of their lives, if you can get them reading, if you get them in a good family. And this, she put in this speech that she made. Uh, you know, it's enough to make anybody mm. cry, actually. It was just amazing. And then you think she managed, of course, to get something in about her husband, Prince William. Mm. And I thought that was lovely too, that he's standing by. None of these nonsenses about him having affairs or he didn't like her oh, anymore. That was rubbish, it's that cruel, was absolutely, absolutely rubbish. cruel. And um, you think about him and what a difficult time he's had. You know, he lost his queen, his grandmother, his grandfather, um, his mother when he was very young, and now he's got the worry of his of his wife, who has done so much for him. She's made him understand what being a husband is like, because mm. he, he came from a place where there wasn't a proper um, marital relationship. Um, and very, very difficult for him. And yet, when he went out to do the engagements he had and he wanted to go to, you would never have known. No. So you think, <clears throat> there is a man who would be a good king because he knows what is expected of him. Um, and I, I just thought it was very moving and that we're very, very lucky to have them, and I hope that the cancer has been found very early, it could very well be like that, and that she mm. will make a full recovery because we really need her. She's we essential. need them. We need those two. We really do. Yes. And of course, Harry and Meghan sent a message. It no? was a bland message, wasn't it? Well, I, um, it... I also thought that they shouldn't have just called her Kent, Ke Kate, uh, Kate, and and the family. I've noticed that they never record called anything like, you know, the, ma the Majesty, Her Majesty, or, you know, the Princess. They don't want to do that. <sighs> well, um, I, I think we'll take Meghan more seriously when she goes to see her father. That's the first thing. I mean, you're gonna, if you're going to say this, then go and see your own dad who's sick. Oh, well, she won't do that. No, she won't. No, not that I see. But what about Queen Camilla? Because she's had to step up, hasn't she? Yes, well, it's very interesting about Queen Camilla because everybody said she would ruin... 30 years ago, mm. when they all hated her, that... Um, she would ruin the whole monarchy and thought she was absolutely appalling because she wasn't fit to be a queen. Um, but she's actually proven very differently. Mm -hmm. She's actually holding up the royal family together. And she's gone away. She doesn't like being in the uh, footlights. I've, I've, I know that, she told me. But she's gone very gently mm -hmm. to do what she thinks is very important. And Ireland is very important to her and to King Charles. So she went on her own. She just did very few that she Charles would have done on his by himself. And she went and visited lots of people. And because she's very warm, um, they they really respond very well to her. And I remember she went a few years ago um, when things were quite difficult and she had this big lunch, they called it, to celebrate um, one of the Queen's birthdays. And um, she sat there and people didn't like her at first, and then said afterwards that they were astonished mm. that she was so easy to talk to. She was so ungrand. Um, but now she seems very regal, but very gently. And she looks as if she's having a lovely time. And I think this will help 
King Charles because he can see that she's doing a brilliant time and she's working incredibly hard. She's 76, 77. Oh, no, aren't they working well, the two of them and yes. the family? Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. One nice thing we need to just say, it's uh, Princess Eugenie's birthday today. She's um, 32. She's in um, very happy with the family. She's a very easy person mm. to get along with, so we can all wish her happy very happy returns. Happy birthday to you, Princess Eugenie. And Angela Levin, thank you so much. Thank you. That is the brilliant Angela Levin, royal biographer. This is GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. Still to come uh, in my Great British Debate, I'm asking, is it time to pull the plug on Rwanda? Up next, though, my difficult conversation with Ryan Mark. First, though, let's get the weather with Marco. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We're starting the weekend on a very showery note across the UK, quite a chilly northwesterly airstream too, but things do look brighter as we head into Sunday. The low pressure is anchored towards the northeast of the UK at the moment, feeding in that uh, brisk northwesterly airstream and plenty of showers around too. And we hold on to a very showery picture across the UK as we head into this evening. Still some heavy ones around with some hail and thunder in places. But notice as we go through the overnight period, the showers tend to become more focused towards northern and northwest facing areas. So some clear spells developing inland and towards the south and east of the UK. The winds just starting to ease down a touch too. But uh, temperatures generally holding up at four to six Celsius in towns and cities, but in rural spots down into low single figures where we could see a touch of frost by Sunday morning. As for Sunday itself, well, a brighter day in store across the bulk of the UK. Still a few showers towards the north and northwest. Lighter winds too tomorrow, and with more than a way of sunshine around, it should feel more pleasant out and about, with temperatures climbing to 10 to 13 Celsius. 13 down towards the south and southeast is 55 in Fahrenheit, which is close to the seasonal average for this time in March. As we head into Monday, though, we see more of an east-west split developing in the weather across the UK. Outbreaks of rain moving in across the west and southwest, starting to turn quite heavy in places, holding on to some sunshine towards the north and east, one or two wintry showers towards the far northeast of the UK. And as we head into the coming week, things will generally turn more unsettled, with temperatures close to the seasonal average, but uh, rain never too far away. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash. Text GB Win to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. 
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, good afternoon. This is GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir and it's just gone five o'clock. And for the next hour, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines right now. Coming up, this week's difficult conversation, I'll be joined by media personality and commentator Ryan Mark Parsons, who's been on a remarkable journey after finding himself in a nightmarish situation when his drink was spiked during a night out in London. Stay tuned, you will not want to miss that story. Then, for the Great British debate this hour. I'm asking, is it time to pull the plug on Rwanda? But first, let's get your latest news. Nana, thanks very much. Good evening from the newsroom. Five o'clock and our top story this hour. The Russian president is continuing to link Ukraine to last night's attack at a concert venue in Moscow, which killed, we now understand, 143 people. Kyiv have described Russia's apparent attempt to blame Ukraine as absolutely untenable and absurd. Neither Vladimir Putin nor the FSB have presented any proof of that link with Ukraine. Meanwhile, the United States has strongly condemned the attack that the US intelligence services believe was carried out by a branch of the Islamic State terror group. In a statement to the nation, President Putin said the terrorists can expect punishment and condemned what he called the barbaric attack. All the executors, planners and those who ordered this crime will be rightfully and inevitably punished, whoever they are and whoever directed them. Let me repeat, we will identify and punish everyone who stood behind the terrorists who prepared this attack against Russia, against our people. Lord Cameron has joined leaders around the world praising the Princess of Wales for what he's called her remarkable strength after she announced she was undergoing treatment for cancer. Cancer charities have also praised the Princess Catherine for speaking about her diagnosis, saying it will encourage others with concerns to visit their doctor. Kate says she and William have been doing everything possible to process and manage the shock news privately for the sake of their young family. The King, who himself was diagnosed with cancer in February, is said to be in the closest contact with his daughter-in-law. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family, but I've had a fantastic medical team who have taken great care of me, for which I'm so grateful. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. Plenty of public reaction as well to that. We've been speaking to people on the streets of Birmingham who've been sending their well wishes to the future Queen. It's got shocking, really. She's got young kids, she's got a family. I think that's probably the more upsetting thing about everything. The public eye and things doesn't really matter at the minute, does it? I think it was a brave decision, and I think that will just uh, awaken people's minds to uh, how, how troublesome cancer is yeah. and to be checked out themselves. Yeah, it's very shocking, really. And obviously, um, you know, it's one in two people are getting cancer now, so I think we all should be a little bit more respectful and just let her get on with it and, uh, you know, to recover with her family and just lay off her a little bit. You know, I think she had a lot of scrutiny over the last few weeks. In other news, we've heard today that the knife crime campaigner Richard Taylor has died at the age of 75 after a long battle with cancer. 
His 10-year-old son, Damilola, was killed in 2000 in what became one of Britain's highest profile crimes. Well, posting on social media, the Home Secretary, James Cleverley, has praised Mr Taylor's determination in the face of what he called huge personal tragedy. The loss led Richard and his late wife, Gloria, to set up a trust aimed at supporting disadvantaged young people. He said his son's death was the result of enormous problems in society, but that he wanted his legacy to be one of hope. Gareth Southgate says the controversy over the New England shirt is not high on his list of priorities as the team prepare to face Brazil. Nike's new kit has been criticised over what it described as a playful redesign of the St George's Cross, with the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak warning against messing with the national flag. But the FA has defended the changes, saying it was a tribute to the 1966 World Cup winning team. It's understood to be selling quickly, though, despite costing £125 per shirt. The England manager says the Three Lions crest is the most important thing on the shirt. More than 80 pubs, clubs and sports centres across the country will receive a funding boost to help keep their doors open. It's part of the government's levelling up programme, which aims to create jobs and to support communities. It will also see the curtains rise again at the Edinburgh Film House, two years after it was forced to close. Following a campaign backed by actors Ewan Bremner and Brian Cox, the independent cinema will get a funding boost worth around £1.5 million. And finally, if you've ever wondered what happened to Agatha Christie's typewriter, well, mystery solved. It's set to go on display as part of a crime fiction exhibition at Cambridge University Library. Her dictaphone will also be part of the show, along with the typescript for her final novel, featuring the famed detective Hercule Poirot. Murder by the Book, which opens today, explores Britain's fondness for fictional sleuths from Sherlock Holmes to Jane Tennyson and Inspector Morse. Those are the headlines. More in the next half hour. And in the meantime, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. But now it's back to Nana. Good afternoon. This is GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir. Uh, and for the next hour, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines right now. If you just tuned in, it's just gone six minutes after five o'clock. And this show is all about opinion. It's mine, it's theirs, and of course it's yours. We'll be debating, discussing, and at times we will disagree, but no one will be cancelled. So joining me today, it's broadcaster and columnist Lizzie Cundy, and also former Labour advisor Matthew Laza. Still to come, my difficult conversation today is with media personality and commentator Ryan Mark Parsons as we discuss the drinking spike ep epidemic with an expert. Then, for the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking, is it time to pull the plug on Rwanda? And all of this as more than 500 migrants crossed the channel on Wednesday, a record for the year. And, of course, after the House of Lords inflicted further defeats on the government over the plan. As ever, get in touch. Email gbviews at gbnews.com or tweet me at gbnews. So it's now time for this week's Difficult Conversations. And today I'm joined by Ryan Mark Parsons. Now, he's a familiar face from his time on The Apprentice and, of course, on Celebs Go Dating. However, today Ryan Mark is here to share a deeply personal and harrowing experience that transcends his public persona, because recently Ryan Mark found himself in a nightmarish situation when his drink was spiked during a night out in London. And what followed was a terrifying ordeal. Uh, so I think we should ask him exactly uh, what, that, what happened. So Ryan Mark is here uh, to talk about this and also uh, to talk to us about raising awareness too, because I hear that yesterday you were with Theresa May. Yes, I was. Yes, I was in Milton Keynes at a Conservative Association dinner and she was the guest speaker and I raised the issue with her one-on-one -on -one, and she thought it was a really admirable cause mm. and that's something I'm looking, uh, looking to champion with Greg Smith, mm. MP for Buckingham, who's been really supportive and I'm going to meet him next week in the Commons to discuss it further mm. because it's something I'm really passionate about and I think there needs to be some changes in legislation mm. in addition to measures that have already been introduced last year by James Cleverley and ensure that people feel safe when they go out to drink mm. and that is really what I would like to see happen. So, so tell us what happened to you. How long ago was it? Mm. And um, just give us an idea of roughly where, where you were. 
So it happened last year, right. and up until recently, I haven't spoken about it. I didn't really talk about it with friends. And last week, I spoke to the Mirror, and I really just gave a, a tell-all in terms of the ordeal. And it happened in the nightclub. I was with friends, and prior to going to the nightclub, I didn't really have many drinks, I was pretty sober. And then I momentarily went to the loo inside the nightclub. I ordered a drink before and I just left it on the side for probably about one minute, I'd say. Mm. And then as soon as I returned, I, there was this, it was at that point that I thought that something is up because I had the drink and then I had to go back to the loo because I just suddenly felt so dizzy it, I mean, it was pretty instantaneous. Mm. And it's a feeling, it was a sensation that I've never experienced before. And then I started questioning, have I drunk that much? Uh, it was complete delirium. And I, again, I felt dizzy. I had this pounding sensation. And I was probably just sat on the loo in this cubicle for about 20 minutes, just trying to figure out what on earth is going on. And whatever was in that drink was probably very strong because I just remember feeling the impact of it pretty quickly as soon as I had the drink that, was, that I left on the side. And I, you know, that was my fault for leaving the drink on the side. I was negligent, but people shouldn't be spiking well, yeah, in the first I mean, place. You know, that's, that's the bottom line. You, don't... <laughs> you leave your drink somewhere, it doesn't mean that, you know, it's your fault if it gets spiked. Yeah. Uh, but obviously nowadays we have to be more, more wary. Absolutely. Was there anybody around you? Or were you talking to anybody or that may have done that to you? Do you have any idea? I have no idea. And a part of getting the symptoms of getting spiked, a lot of, the, a lot of your memory, your recollection of what happened becomes very fragmented because of the drug, whatever's laced in the drink. And I entered the nightclub with friends and then I can't remember much in terms of what happened after. I, it's very broken. I left, I remember leaving the nightclub. I hurt my leg, so that's what I remember. I was with no one. I was alone outside the nightclub and then it becomes quite fuzzy. The next thing I remember, being locked inside someone's car, two men were inside the car. They essentially held me hostage in the car. Wow. Uh, I was demanding they let me out. It became, qu it escalated pretty rapidly. It, I was shouting. And a part of getting spiked, <coughs> which I realised after, is that you lose all sense of fear. So, ordinarily, I wouldn't be so brazen. I mean, these guys were pretty intimidating. That's what I remember. I do have, again, faint memories. My phone was on charge for some reason. One guy was in the front, another guy was in the back, and I just remember shouting, get, let me out of this car. And I remember trying the handle, it was locked, and eventually somehow I was able to escape. And the next memory I have of that night was probably Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, and I was sprawled ac across a bench. And it was as people were arriving into London, uh, completely mortifying. But again, I, ha I had no control, no fear, no sense of rationality. It was completely disorientating. I've never experienced anything like that. Do you think those guys were trying to help you? Because if they were charging your phone, perhaps you don't know. Maybe they were trying to realise something odd had happened to you and were keeping you in a safe place and charging your phone for you because you said you were charging your phone. Potentially. I mean, I do remember I was covered in sick. Oh, um, no. It, it was, in their car, it, they even put you in the car covered with sick. <laughs> well, I mean, it, was, it was horrendous. But what I do find strange is that they wouldn't let me out after... Uh, because I do remember distinctly shouting to let me out of the car uh, using various expletives, and I just needed to get out. I just didn't want to be trapped inside yeah, a, around a stranger's car. Reeking of sick. Yeah. But, they, but, I mean, but the fact that they even put you in the car whilst you have sick all over you, I, you know, and the fact that they're charging your phone. But again, you're in a vulnerable position. You don't know what's happened, so you don't know whether they're good or bad. Well, that's it. And my memory, again, was just so fractured. Mm. All of these events that happened subsequently after I left the club, mm. I can't quite work out how I went from one place to the other. I mean, the sequence of what happened is just so beguiling to me. So, yeah. I mean, that is the thing with spiking. It's, it's so powerful and it just leaves anyone who has been spiked, the victims of spiking, in a completely and utterly vulnerable position. Yeah, yeah it, it is frightening. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. Obviously, stay with me, but I want to speak to somebody who um, has a business or works alongside a business that deal with this kind of thing. So joining me now is Amanda French. She's Chief Operating Officer for CheckYourDrink.com. Uh, Amanda, you heard Ryan's story. Harrowing, frightening. Yeah. This must be Absolutely. becoming all too familiar. You're hearing this a lot, right? 
Yeah, yeah, it's terrible. And it's it's increasing every year. Um, it's very difficult to know what you can do to actually stop these people. Um, so we do our best to basically try and inform people what they can do to keep safe. Um, and, you know, always stay with your friends um, and also have drink spiking tests with you as well. Because then if you do get any kind of feeling could be dubious characters hanging around or something, then test your drink. Um, there's no harm in doing that. Um, yeah. <laughs> have drinking strips that people can dip into a drink and it will tell you whether there's any chemicals available. Can people... Mm. Is this sort of thing, why, I guess I would expect that clubs should be giving these out literally for free. You come in the club, you can check yeah. your drink any time. Yes, that's what we hope. Um, we're we're going to be um, doing our best to try and persuade clubs to, to get um, various tests in. We've got like um, little sponsorship cards here that um, you've got a test on either side and then on the back you can put your company logo and a strap line or something as well. And these could be behind the bar. So if anybody's feeling unsafe, they go up to the bar and, and then the staff can actually do a quick test for you. Yeah, because they and should be it mandatory. also means that people... Yeah, absolutely. And it means that people can get caught as well. We've had one case where um, a pub phoned us up and said, thank you so much for your test. Mm. Um, we were actually able to catch someone um, because the person went straight up to the bar, got, the, got it tested, and um, she could pinpoint who it was. Wow. And they got the police in and they got taken away. So that was great. It's a serious crime. <laughs> well, we need I... more of that. So, well, yeah. Where can people find these, just briefly, so people can know where to go if they want to find these, these drinking, these strips? Yep, you can get them on checkyourdrink.co.uk on the website there. Um, we're also going to be producing some wristbands, which I think you can just yeah. about see there. Um, so these are, are going to be available for festivals or if you wanted to just buy um, one yourself. They're actually just starting to get into production now. Sorry, I've got the camera in the wrong place. That's OK. We can see um, it. But ultimately, <laughs> this, this, the government should be really then, involved in this, really. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Um, we've got to basically push for, for people to, um, for government to take it on board and do as much as they can to actually insist that um, pubs and clubs have some kind of um, test in place. The, they have brought legislation in in Europe, in Spain, just mm -hmm. recently, and also in America, where every pub and club has to have a drink spiking test. Um, right. yeah. And and it can be it's it's really good for the businesses as well because if people know that their venue is safe to go to because they've got drink spiking tests available, then, then people that's going to deter spikers going there. And and, and, and obviously you're encourage... going to get more people coming. Ma Manda Friend, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. That's Manda Friend there. Check your drink. Oh, come, really good Pleasure. to talk to you. Right, so joining me still is Ryan Mark. You too. Um, would, would that have helped you if there'd been some sort of... Because had you, had you already drank the drink, was there any suspicion in you when you picked up your drink to see? Because sometimes you do get a sort of feeling, ooh, that doesn't feel right. I'm going to quickly just... Do you ever, did you have any of that? Well, yeah, I mean, the impact of drinking it and whatever was in the drink, I mean, it was pretty rapid mm. and I did feel uh, something didn't seem right when after I drunk the the drink so having a testing strip would have been ideal and the thing is the window to get tested through urine mm. is about 48 hours so in order to even bring evidence to the police for a successful prosecution, you need to get tested within 48 hours. And also I find that a lot of men and women, there's a stigma, especially I find with men, mm. and this is why I want to be so public about this and raise awareness, to destigmatize reports, because ultimately the police need to receive these reports in order to rectify what's going on here and to deal with the prevalence of spiking, which is an epidemic across the UK. And this is what I'm looking to work with Greg Smith on, the MP for Buckingham. And I, like I said, I have conversations with him next week to hopefully introduce a bill, a 10-minute bill, where we can campaign and hopefully change legislation where any venue that serves alcohol, uh, whether that be bars or nightclubs, as, as a condition of their licence, they should be providing drinks covers and testing strips to provide reassurance for punters looking to just have a good night, mm. to feel safe and ultimately, as the other guests were saying, to deter people from going into these venues and 
spiking people. What does it come to that people actually think that that's something that you would do to somebody? I mean, why, why would you do that to somebody and risk their safety? It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's disgusting. Absolutely, yeah. Well, listen, Ryan, Mark, good luck with all of that. Thank and, you very uh, much. You've seen Amanda. You should get in touch with Amanda as well, but, you know... Um, yeah. You should collaborate and see what you can do, because I I'm so glad I'm not young these yeah. days, but I suppose even old people like me... Anyone can be a target. Exactly. That's the issue, Any yeah. Anyone's a target. Mm -hmm. Ryan Mark Parsons, thank you so thank much. You, you take care of yourself. That was, of course, Ryan Mark Parsons. That was his story. Wow. Uh, it's a serious issue. It needs to be addressed. We'll uh, follow that case and we'll bring him back and see how far he's got with it. But if you've just tuned in, welcome abroad. This is GB News coming up. My panel will be going head to head in the quick fire quiz. But next, it's time for the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, is it time to pull the plug on Rwanda? You're with me. This is GB News. Don't go anywhere. is GB News, Britain's news channel. Can the Church of England not spend their money as they wish? The Church of England can do amazing things for this country and for the world, and I'm not sure why it's chosen to focus on this specific issue. You know, one of the causes that I've always thought the church was very good at were things called almshouses, which were basically houses that would be built on church estates for the needy. Not only did they want to spend £100 million on this fund, that they wanted to spend £1 billion on reparations as well. But why not spend a hundred million or a billion pounds on a new generation of almshouses as opposed to just helping one group of people, black British people, why not just help all people in need? Alex. Well, I, I just don't understand what the Church of England is trying to do. It's on its deathbed. Congregations have, have reduced. Reduced. I mean, deathbed is maybe a I mean, well, <laughs> well, look, if we look over 20 years, it's dramatically lower than it used to be. And, and, and a lot of criticism from actual Christians come from the, the values that the Church of England are now propagating. And Justin Welby has a lot to answer for because, you know, not only are we seeing in the news this mass conversion of illegal immigrants to a gay mass system in the UK, but now we're seeing them spending money... And, and as Albie actually pointed out correctly, it, it, in, in, a, in a way that doesn't really benefit broader society, it benefits a very small group of people. So I, I just don't know where it's going to end. This committee has also said one million is not enough. 100, it's 100 million, sorry. Um, it's, the, it, church commissioners are now hoping to, for a target of one billion. I mean, I mean it's, it's, a... it's work nonsense, isn't it? You could make the argument that this is charity. Austin Welby's job is to be a virtue, should, virtue should, signaller, well, is it charity not? charity discriminate? I mean, that's what he's saying. We're only going to give this to people from a specific skin colour or background. I don't think that's a, a very Christian of them. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good afternoon. Welcome to GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir, and it's just gone 22 minutes after 5 o'clock. Uh, so lots of you have been getting in touch with your thoughts on Kate. Uh, John says, yes, I know I speak for all throughout the world in wishing Princess of Wales get well soon and a speedy recovery, especially after her cancer diagnosis. I do wish Kate and Princess, the Princess of Wales to beat this cancer so she can get back to her family fully. And yes, they should be 
be left alone to get well and recuperate after such news. Uh, Carol says, wishing the Princess Kate a speedy recovery. I feel with her very brave speech, she has helped so many that are going through what she is going through. I feel Kate has given so much strength to so many that are going through. Sending so much love to Kate and others who are going through uh, the same thing. We'll keep all of those coming. It's really lovely to hear your messages. And, you know, Kate, if you're watching, or Catherine, if you're watching, uh, we absolutely love you. We hope uh, that you get well quickly. But now it's time for the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, is it time to pull the plug on Rwanda? 900 people have crossed the channel in small boats in the last week. More than 500 arriving on Wednesday alone. Now, a record for the year, in fact. And despite this, still no flights have taken off to Rwanda. But the government maintains that it wants to get flights to Rwanda off the ground during the spring. Now, uh, that's not looking likely after the House of Lords inflicted fresh defeat on the government over its flagship bill, meaning a further delay to it becoming law. The legislation won't be back in Parliament until the 15th of April. This is just ridiculous. And get this, the Home Secretary, James Cleverly, one night trip to Rwanda cost £165,000 on a private jet. So for the great British debate this hour, I'm asking, is it time to pull the plug on Rwanda? Well, joining me now, former chief immigration officer at UK Border Force, Kevin Saunders, and broadcaster and lawyer, Andrew Eborn. OK, I I'm going to start with you. Kevin, is it time to just pull the plug on this thing? It doesn't feel like it's going to go anywhere. Good afternoon, Anna. No, it is not time. We have to persevere with Rwanda. Everybody in the know has said that the UK if the UK wants to stop illegal migration, we need a deterrent. And the deterrent, the big deterrent, is Rwanda. Get Rwanda through, it sends a message that we will not allow people to break the law coming into the UK in this illegal and dangerous manner. So, yes, we need to keep Rwanda. Sooner yeah, the better. You think? All right, Andrew Eborn. It's very simple. It's always a delight to share a studio with Kevin from Border Fast. It's always a... Border a, Fast? A, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Thank you. That's what Banksy, <laughs> Banksy always said. Border Fast is the reality. I'll tell you, let, let's put this into perspective. Uh, it was Abraham Lincoln who said, if you count the tail of a dog as a leg, how many legs does a dog have? Well, the answer is still four, because you can't call a tail a leg. And that's exactly what's happening about Rwanda. They're calling it a safe country. We have the absurd situation now where Britain, has just been said by the Irish court, is no longer a safe country because we're going to send people off to Rwanda. The real mischief of this, Kevin, is, as, as I know you'll admit, is it's the people traffickers who need to be targeted. We had last year 29,437 people cross the English Channel successfully. They all came over here. Rwanda can only deal with, at the moment, 200 200, 200. So you've got the rest of the thousands. It's not going to work on that sort of basis. What we need to do is target the real issue, and the real issue is the people traffickers. But what makes you think, Andrew, is that just because you may only initially... And it was an opening number, so you're being a bit, a bit disingenuous to assume that that is the full number. That's not what they said. It's a starter. Um, nobody wants to be one of the first of the 200, let's be honest. And you are creating a deterrent, so you're not really wanting to have to do this. That is the point of it, surely. Well, I, I hope it's a deterrent, because that's is the whole point. Nobody... Well, we don't know. We haven't seen that yet. So, clearly, the numbers which you quoted at the beginning of your excellent introduction, um, when the threat of Rwanda is almost there now, uh, that obviously hasn't deterred people at all that they might get sent there. But I do believe, I do believe that somebody will be sent, and so Piers Morgan will lose his £1,000 bet with Rishi. I do believe that they will be sent. But the point is this. It's about effectiveness. If you look at the mischief, it's the key that it's got to be the deterrent. But at the moment, the Financial Times estimated it was actually quarter of a million pounds per immigrant. I, in the latest report I've seen, they're saying it's at least 151,000. Yeah. So cost return is not looking very good. Yeah, but you're, that, again, I think that's disingenuous because that's not a lifetime cost. That is an initial cost. Once that person is in this country, then the remaining cost, there are other costs that you haven't even factored in, like where they're going to live, we've got to pay for that, everything else. Uh, Kevin? Yes. Well, it's a pleasure always to talk about this with Andrew. He knows I won't agree with him. But um, it, it, it's fantastic to talk about the people smugglers. Let's talk about the people smugglers. We can't get hold of the people smugglers. They're in Turkey. We can't send British policemen to Turkey to arrest people smugglers. He knows as well as anybody that we would have to work 
with the Turkish authorities to uh, try and get our hands on the people smugglers. And every time they catch one, and catching one is difficult enough, another two spring up. It's like cutting the head off the hydra. So let's try and chase the people smugglers, but let's not rely on it. You've got to have a deterrent. I said three years ago, if you want to stop people coming to the UK, you've got to make the UK less attractive. And what do we do? We make it more attractive. So let's let's push on with Rwanda. Let's start seeing the planes go. Let's see the three other African countries, which nobody wants to talk about at the moment, that have expressed an interest in doing this as well. Let's look at the VAR program as well, which has come out. And let's see if we can actually do something about this. Mm. Because, come on, <clears throat> Andrew, it's looking a bit... We are embarrassing ourselves on the world stage, frankly, with the House of Lords stepping in and saying, we're not going to do what the people, the majority of the people have been saying, just do something and this might work. And now Rwanda are turning around to us and saying, eh, we don't know whether we want to deal with you anyway. Oh, absolutely. It's the traditional ping-pong with more pong than ping is what's happening. And it will do the dance and it will get through. I can tell you it will get through from a legal point of view. It always follows the same pattern. My point is absolutely we need to do something Thing, but is there something more effective? With that quarter of a million that the FT estimate, wouldn't that be better? If you gave a reward for people to disclose who these people traffickers are, you only have one person who could get that 250,000 and you stop the people traffickers, that would be an interesting approach. No, because it's like a head of the, uh, the head of a serpent, another one will spring up. He's already said that. Well, you can have many serpents, but there's a lot of £250,000 on offer if you're going to keep doing it on this sort of Well, basis. then you'll just have loads of people being paid £250,000 and the whole thing will carry on. Don't be so naive, Andrew. <laughs> Is he being naive, Kevin? He's being naive, isn't he? Final word to you, Kevin, briefly. Yeah, I mean, uh, and Andrew's playing devil's advocate. He does it exceedingly well. <laughs> um, what we've got to do is stop making the UK so attractive. And that's what's dragging the people here. It's because... They think they reached uh, El Dorado when they when they get to the UK. Mm. Everything's free. That's what they want. Yes. And, and they can go to work as well because working in the unregulated economy in the UK is dead easy, as we all know. Mm. So with that, so Rwanda, we've got to press on with Rwanda. And also, I'm a, I'm a big supporter of the Voluntary Assisted Returns Program wow. VAR as well. Well, listen, if only it were El Dorado, that's somewhere else, isn't it? Spain. <laughs> <laughs> listen, thank you so much, Andrew Eborn and also uh, um, Kevin... Um, Kevin Saunders, there you go. I should have thought of Colonel <laughs> Saunders, Colonel K. <laughs> Colonel KFC, Saunders. KFC, KFC chicken. Absolutely. I'll think about that next time. Thank you so much. <laughs> right, so what do you think? That's their thoughts. What are yours? But now it's time for the Great British Giveaway. We've got a shopping spree, a garden gadget bundle and 12,345 quid available. Here's how. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax free cash. Text GB Win to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Yes, good luck indeed. This is GB News. We're live on TV, online and on digital radio and Nana Aquir. Coming up, we'll continue with the Great British debate this hour. And I'm asking, is it time to pull the plug on Rwanda? You'll hear the thoughts of my panel, broadcast from columnist Lizzie Cundy, and also former Labour Party advisor Matthew Laza. But first, let's get your latest news headlines.
Nana, thank you very much and a very good evening from the newsroom. A recap of the headlines just after half past five. The Russian president is continuing to link Ukraine to last night's attack on a concert hall in Moscow, where 143 people are now known to have been killed. The United States has strongly condemned that attack that US intelligence services believe was carried out by a branch of the Islamic State terror group. Meanwhile, Kyiv has described Russia's attempt to blame Ukraine as absurd. Neither Vladimir Putin nor the FSB have presented any proof of that link. In a statement to the nation, President Putin said the terrorists can expect punishment and he condemned what he called a barbaric attack. Here in the UK, cancer charities have praised the Princess of Wales for speaking about her diagnosis, saying it will encourage others with concerns to visit their doctor. Kate said she and William have been doing everything possible to process and manage the shock news privately for the sake of their young family. The King has called her courageous for choosing to speak out publicly about her condition. Knife crime campaigner Richard Taylor has died at the age of 75 after his long battle with cancer. His 10-year-old son Damilola was killed in 2000 in what became one of Britain's highest profile crimes. The devastating loss led Mr Taylor and his late wife, Gloria, to set up a trust aimed at supporting disadvantaged young people. He said his son's death was the result of enormous problems in society, but that he wanted his legacy to be one of hope. And Britain is in the midst of the longest sustained rise in people missing work due to sickness since the 1990s. Researchers by, from the Resolution Foundation found that nearly 2.7 million people are too sick to work, with figures highest among the youngest and oldest workers. It means that Britain is the only G7 economy not to have returned to pre-COVID levels of employment. Those are the headlines. More in half an hour. In the meantime, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or go to our website, gbnews.com alerts. Now, though, it's back to Nana. So coming up, we'll be discussing the mini debate and why people are so intrigued with Princess Catherine and her medical information, which I think uh, actually we should be leaving her alone. Next, we'll continue with the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, is it time to pull the plug on Rwanda? This is GB News. Do not go anywhere. Britain's Newsroom. Weekday mornings from 9.30. Men's mental health. Yeah. Men are starting to talk a lot more. Yeah. You've been through a lot of stuff that uh, people don't know about. Yeah, I mean, um, the last few years for me have been very, very difficult. Um, people, don't, people see me on tour, performing, making music. Um, but um, myself and my wife, um, you know, we went through um, two miscarriages. Oh, um, wow. You know, and, you know, for us... That was a very devastating mm. course. time and very difficult to, to to know how to kind of process those emotions. Mm. And I guess as a man, I I did the thing of bottling up my emotions and where I feel comfortable to to be able to express myself is in the studio. Whereas you know she had obviously a different reaction to you know what happened to us because not only was it happening to her mentally, psychologically, but it was happening to her physically as well. And I think what Something that she really would wanted to see from me was that sensitivity and that emotion. And I thought that as a man, being strong was trying to bottle up my emotions and just show her that no, mm. you know that I'm, I'm being strong for her. Mm. But actually, being strong was is talking about it. Mm. And what's happened ever since I've started to talk about it is I've spoken to more men that have experienced baby loss. My wife forced out of me, you know, how do you feel? And I ended up as a mess on the floor. I was exasperating, crying, mm -hmm. almost inconsolable. She was just holding me in her arms um, as we cried together, and we cried together. Um, and I didn't realise I needed that release so badly. Like I said, I've been able to speak to other men, and, and, and we've been able to cry together, and they've, they shared their own experiences, which they did similar to me. But actually, you know, as men, I feel like that conversation and that sensitivity and being able to be mm -hmm. emotional together Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness. 
to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, there's 21 minutes to go. This is GB News, I'm Nana Aquir. We are live on TV, online and on digital radio. It's time now for the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, is it time to pull the plug on Rwanda? 900 people have crossed this week. Yes, in the small boats, they have come in their droves. More than 500 of them arrived on Wednesday, which is actually a record for the year. And despite this, still no flights have taken off to Rwanda. But the government maintains that it wants to get these flights off the ground during the spring. Uh, but that actually isn't looking very lightly after the House of Lords inflicted more defeats on the government over the flagship bill, meaning that a further delay to it becoming law. And the legislation won't be back in Parliament until the 15th of April, so all of that. And then this, Home Secretary James Cleverly, his one-night Rwanda trip, which cost more than £165,000, all of that on a private jet. So, for the Great British Debate this hour, you literally couldn't make this up. I'm asking, is it time to pull the plug on Rwanda? Well, let's see what my panel will make of that. I'm joined by broadcaster and columnist Lizzie Cundy, and also former Labour Party advisor Matthew Larza. Uh, I think I'll start with... Uh, I'm going to go with you, Matthew Larza, okay. because you are... Um, well, you're from the Labour Party. You want to get rid of the Rwanda plan, but then they don't appear to have any other... No, we, we, we have got a plan. No, no, we, uh, so my answer to your question in terms of uh, is it time to pull the plug on Rwanda is a very definite yes. Well, of course you would say it's, that. Well, it's been an outrageous use of taxpayers' money and an outrageous distraction from what we really should be doing. I mean, you said uh, that no uh, no plane has taken off um, with asylum seekers, which is absolutely well, it's right. Well, partly because of the, the Labour Party and... The no, no because... Well, well, because uh, well, uh, well, I'll come back to that in a second. But we just to remind ourselves that just like James Cleverly, we've sent mm. more home secretaries than we have asylum seekers so what's your point? to Rwanda. So the point, the point is that it's a distraction of what we should be doing, which is concentrating on smashing the criminal gangs and processing people faster. So that the real deterrent is if people know that they're going to be in Britain for a matter of days but or you a heard what Kevin said. Not. They're in Turkey. We can't get hold of them in well, Turkey. That's and it's like the head of a head of Medusa, like a Medusa snake. Yeah. Both of them. Obviously, it's 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 tough. But what we need is a new cross-border police force uh, and to use anti-terror legislation. But what about now? Oh, okay, okay. So that's what we do for yeah, in government. Okay. That's what Tory should be doing. Well, I'm now. listening. A new. This all sounds very good. How long does it take to set up a cross-border well, police force? Well, I think it force? can take uh, just a couple years. of months. No, not as long as years. It's, no, not as long as it's taken years, Matthew. No, Lazar. because because um, uh, Keir's already been for talks uh, with Europol. The uh, uh, and it will still and take years. It will take months. You know how long it took. Just, to make one just on, your, just on the point about, about, about this ping-ponging between the House of Commons and the House of Lords, mm. um, uh, Rishi Sunak has sent his MPs home next week. Labour said, we'll sit whenever you want. We accept that the bill has come back, for, back from the House of Lords. We're ready to debate it. So it's not Labour holding it up. Rishi, who says it's his priority, didn't bother bringing it to Lizzie the Lizzie Cundy. Look, Rwanda is a catastrophic disaster, <laughs> which <laughs> is costing the taxpayer millions and millions, nearly 500 millions. Now, Nana is getting out of hand. Totally. It's not going to work. Totally. And Rishi, the best thing he can do, because he's about as useful as an ashtray on a motorbike, is <laughs> get out of this job. Because, <laughs> let me tell you, the boats are going to keep coming. Mm. But the other day, 514 over in 10 vessels. Please, this is a disaster. It's a national security emergency. Yeah, but, but we Lizzie. have to do what what Italy did. Which what, is what? Which you said it was a national security emergency. No more people coming in. This, we have to turn the boats around. Yeah, but we, but we, 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 we do need, we can do all that, but we still need we, a deterrent and to yeah, stop people. Well, well, we, where are we going to put these people then? In the UK territories. We, why Rwanda? We've got south of Georgia. We have the Falklands. But, but, but the people in the centers. Falklands don't want these people. Why well, should south they have... Well, Georgia, what? why not there? Well, why we they could, don't want them did, either? That's we not could on. have a, a big, uh, you know, we've got the, we've got the Navy who, who could be there. We have, we can do a big, as you said before, a big cruise. Put them on and process them. We have 129 
9,000 that's still waiting to be processed. Some are taking for years and years. It's costing us to put them in hotels over 8 million. My hotel locally, no one could go in anymore. It's full of yeah, you but, know, but military Lizzie, aged but, men but Lizzie, outside. But Lizzie, Lizzie, I get this. But Rwanda was an attempt to try and deter people. But the only people that have deterred Rwanda are the British, so the, the House of Lords, the Labour Party, and yet the British public has said, look, we'll go behind, we'll go with it, but you've got to get on with it. But it's all this delaying and dithering it's that's made happening. us look so stupid. No, there's not a plane taken off and it's already cost mm. what it's cost the taxpayer. Mm. It's an absolute disaster and Rishi needs to go. Because Labour isn't against uh, offshore processing. It's particularly the way the government's decided to do it. Because you said about the Italians. The Italians are trying to do a deal, uh, as are other European countries, where people are processed in North Africa, so much closer mm. to where they're coming from, with the, with the route that they take, uh, and therefore be much quicker. And that's, and that's actually you're, much more like the Australian scheme. Rwanda is always... That, but the Labour Party were against offshore processing. Well, you have modified the language. No, no, no sorry. Well, hold on. Yeah, You've sorry. modified the language so that they can get away with now uh, allowing offshore we're processing. We're against offshore... Just to be absolutely they clear, were we're against, against offshore processing where it's done under somebody else's law. We're in favour of doing it. You can do it offshore where it's under uh, British law, which is what the Italians are doing. It will be under Italian <laughs> law. <laughs> no, no, it makes a big difference. <laughs> it's, and, that, and that would get through the courts. <laughs> that would get through the courts, Nana. Yes, that of course. That would get through the courts. You said you'd reverse for one day. Yes, because know. it's so expensive. I want to ask but you, nobody if, have gone. if he was sitting here now, just who, who owns these boats? How many is he prosecuted? Who, who's running the crew? No crew. That's no, why we want to no use no anti-terror legislation. Why Absolutely. Anti-terror. You want to make some more laws up now. No, we're not making them up. This show is nothing without you, Neil Fuse. Let's welcome our great British voices. Their opportunity to be on the show and tell us what they think about the topics we're discussing. I've got four of you. Oh, I'm going to start. Oh, just three. Sorry, I lie. I'm going to start with Adrian. I'll go from that end. Oh, in Shropshire. Adrian. Oh, geez, what do you make of this? Is it time to scrap? How are you? Good. No logo. Good. good. See you good. again. Yeah. This whole Rwanda thing, it's, it's just become an expensive sham, but it's mm. all that's left to us mm. at the moment. So we've got, we've got to continue with it. I mean, unfortunately, I wish that we were as tough as what Margaret Thatcher might have done, because she might have sent our boats, our own boats, out into the, into the channel and sunk these wretched things as they come well, in. No, you can't do can't that, because then you, people the would die. You, you, you can't, can't just sink you the boats. do that. No, that's not right. You can't do that. No, not unfortunately. You don't want to kill a load of people. Adrian, I'm going to stop you there before you get yourself no, in you trouble. No, you don't want to kill a load of people. No, of you don't want to do that. No, no, but no. We need, but we do need to carry on with this policy because there is, there is nothing left for us. Yeah, yeah, OK. Um, expensive though it is. Where's my tea? OK. Um, where's my cup? I haven't got my cup. Lizzie, give me a not cup. Not this one, Nana, is it? No. Oh, yeah, it is. Have you got a GB News mug as well? <laughs> there you go. Uh, let's go to you, Jonathan Jones in Cornwall. Ah. Uh, yeah, what's that on there, Cap? Jonathan Jones. Jonathan. Jonathan's frozen. Jonathan's frozen. OK, OK, let's go to, uh, let's go to you uh, in uh, Watford. David Balm. Uh, I love the proposition that we uh, process people over off certain shore and we stop the people there. The people we need to stop are not going to be stopped by the offshore processing. They're the legitimate people. We are talking about criminals. Who are not going to be worried about being processed in a boat and in the channel to try and get them off shore, get them somewhere else sent back. You can't send boats into the channel and turn them around. That would be immoral and illegal. We have to have the Rwanda plan for the moment and then let them work on it. But so far, all Labour and everybody else go, it won't work, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. The United Nations send people to Rwanda. It can't be that bad a country, or are the UN so corrupt and idiot? To but it's, it's OK for them. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, the Rwandans are rightly insulted uh, by our holier-than-thou attitude, like we are so much better than them. Let's be honest, a lot of the countries we trade, trade with have had their own genocides not so long ago, <coughs> and we don't mind about that, so I'm wondering what this is all about. But David Balm, thank you so much, and also the fabulous Adrian in Shropshire. Thank you, lovely to talk to you both. Very shame Jonathan just vanished with his tea. I, obviously, I didn't realise he was frozen. Uh, but listen, I want to hear from you as well, your views, gbviews at gbnews.com or tweet us at uh, gbnews. But still to come, uh, we're going to be discussing loads more and the quiz is on the way, so do not go anywhere. That's it. Yes. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We're starting the weekend on a very showery note across the UK, quite a chilly northwesterly airstream too, but things do look brighter as we head into Sunday. 
Low pressure is anchored towards the northeast of the UK at the moment, feeding in that uh, brisk northwesterly airstream and plenty of showers around too. And we hold on to a very showery picture across the UK as we head into this evening. Still some heavy ones around with some hail and thunder in places. But notice as we go through the overnight period, the showers tend to become more focused towards northern and northwest facing areas. So some clear spells developing inland and towards the south and east of the UK. The winds just starting to ease down a touch too but uh, temperatures generally holding up at four to six Celsius in towns and cities, but in rural spots down into low single figures where we could see a touch of frost by Sunday morning. As for Sunday itself, well a brighter day in store across the bulk of the UK, still a few showers towards the north and northwest, lighter winds too tomorrow, and with more in the way of sunshine around, it should feel more pleasant out and about, with temperatures climbing to 10 to 13 Celsius, 13 down towards the south and southeast is 55 in Fahrenheit, which is close to the seasonal average for this time in March. As we head into Monday though, we see more of an east-west split developing in the weather across the UK. Outbreaks of rain moving in across the west and southwest starting to turn quite heavy in places. Holding on to some sunshine towards the north and east, one or two wintry showers towards the far northeast of the UK. And as we head into the coming week, things will generally turn more unsettled, with temperatures close to the seasonal average, but rain never too far away. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon. If you just tuned in, where have you been? It's near the end of the show now, but don't worry, because it's time for the quick fire quiz. I'm Nana Aquir, and that's the part of the show where I test my panel on some of the other stories that have been hitting the headlines right now. Joining me, uh, broadcaster and columnist Lizzie Cundy, and also former Labour Party advisor Matthew Larza. Right, uh, so, uh, right, let's, uh, Lizzie Cundy, your buzzer, please. Matthew Larza, your buzzer. Right, and please play along at home. Question one, which supermarket was the first this week to send customers into a frenzy when contactless payments went down? Was it A, Tesco, B, Sainsbury's, or C, Little? Matthew Laza. It was B, Sainsbury's. B, Sainsbury's? Uh, was, was Sainsbury's. It was Sainsbury's, but you should have said Tesco just in case. I got there first. It was B. Did you think you got there first? Yes. Mm, OK. <laughs> you may think. Yes, apparently it was. <laughs> yes, the film... Question two. The film Oppenheimer has 13 nominations at the Oscars this year. But how many awards did they take home? Closest answer wins. <laughs> OK, that wasn't you first, Lizzie. I'm sorry. Go on. Nine. Matthew Laza. Lizzie Gundy. Ten. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> Sorry, Lizzie. Oh, I feel so yeah. bad. <laughs> I do a little okay, bit. OK, true or false? I thought we'd have a little bit of chat here. True or false? Yeah, OK. Did female GB Olympian Rebecca Adlington announce she was retiring? <laughs> Hadn't finished the question. Oh. She's retiring. Lizzie Cundy? Yes, she did. Is it true? True. Lizzie I'm going to say false because they, otherwise it's, it's pointless. Well, it's otherwise, true. because even though she's been convincing, she could be wrong. Yes, she's done it exactly. many times before. She does, has. Let's have a look. Are you right? It's false! <laughs> <laughs> Lizzie, 
Lizzie, you, see, you now can't that. win. <laughs> just for fun now, Lizzie. Poor Lizzie. There's a I'm going to pay a price for this in the green room. <laughs> <laughs> I'll fight to the end. Yeah, so it's false. The people who had retired, well, it was a Dame Laura Kenny. Do you remember her? She's the cyclist. Uh, yes, she I did. Announced I read that, she was yeah. retiring. Because yeah. uh, she wants to spend more time with her family. Bless her little heart. Oh. Oh. She's, she's, she's won her medals. Well yes. done. Yeah, and also as you get a bit older, and also the cycling yeah, is a bit the, painful. I can't. I'm not. I, I'm. I, yeah, my, my cycling good skills are not that good. So. Keep moving. Be like my mum. 89 years old. On mm. the move. Keep well, moving. And dancing. Yeah. Oh, Your mum likes to dance. She does. She? Question four. The Royal Mint, who are in charge of making all British coins, have released a set of coins themed around a film franchise. But what franchise is it? Is it A. Harry Potter, B. Avengers, or C. Star Wars? <laughs> Lizzie Cundy. Harry Potter. A. I think it is Harry Potter, but I'm going to say uh, Star Wars. I can only take your first answer. C. So you're going to say anyway. C, but you... Yeah, I know, because you don't care now. It is C, <laughs> actually. It's... Oh, God, David! Oh, my God! Can I just say, they've also, they've also oh. done a, a range around George Michael, and I bought one for my friend. Oh, did you? Who's did you? leaving the country to go to New York to work, and I'm going to take... He's a big George fan, mm. and he's got a George um, coin from the Royal Mint. Just arrived the other day. Well, let's hope he doesn't spend it. Is it spendable? No, I think you can take it to the Bank of England, but um, I'm going to try and turn it into, like, a sort of necklace for him. Oh, that's good, because it would be really bad if you went... Oh, my God, yes. I've just spent no, the coin! Yeah. <laughs> but it's going to take a little bit of Britain with him. Oh, bless his That's very awesome. kind. You are thoughtful, after all. Oh, I'm Nice, isn't he lovely? Right, and final question, question five. What type of tree has just been voted European Ooh. Tree of the Year? Come on, Lizzie Cundy. Oak. Uh, horse chestnut. Horse chestnut. I don't know. Horse, chestnut. <laughs> horse chestnut tree. The answer is... A beach. beach. A beach tree. Cool. Is that anywhere near Did so you get a single answer right no. there, Lizzie? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just saying. Sorry, but... No, I did no sense for it. You did no. Yeah, you would have... Uh, yeah. But uh, anyway, out on today's show, I've been asking... Can't win them all, darling. No. At least one would have been good. <laughs> yeah. Should corporations leave our flag alone? And according to our Twitter poll, 62.9% of you say yes, and 37.1% of you say no. Interesting. Well, so leave our flag alone. Thank you so much to... Uh, my panel, Pleasure broadcast from columnist Lizzie Cundy. Lizzie Cundy, thank you so much. Thank you. And also former Labour Party advisor Matthew Lala. Thank you, thank you so much, Matthew. Thank I thought you. I'd get that in just at the end. And a huge thank you to you at home for your company. I'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place, from three o'clock till six, with the fabulous Danny Kelly and Christine Hamilton. But I'll leave you with the weather. Enjoy and have a fabulous evening. Looks like things are heating up. Box Spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We're starting the weekend on a very showery note across the UK, quite a chilly northwesterly airstream too, but things do look brighter as we head into Sunday. The low pressure is anchored towards the northeast of the UK at the moment, feeding in that uh, brisk northwesterly airstream and plenty of showers around too. And we hold on to a very showery picture across the UK as we head into this evening. Still some heavy ones around with some hail and thunder in places. But notice as we go through the overnight period, the showers tend to become more focused towards northern and northwest facing areas. So some clear spells developing inland and towards the south and east of the UK. The winds just starting to ease down a touch too. But uh, temperatures generally holding up at 4 to 6 Celsius in towns and cities, but in rural spots down into low single figures where we could see a touch of frost by Sunday morning. As for Sunday itself, well, a brighter day in store across the bulk of the UK. Still a few showers towards the north and northwest. Lighter winds too tomorrow, and with more in the way of sunshine around, it should feel more pleasant out and about, with temperatures climbing to 10 to 13 Celsius. 13 down towards the south and southeast is 55 in Fahrenheit, which is close to the seasonal average for this time in March. As we head into Monday, though, we see more of an east-west split developing in the weather across the UK. Outbreaks of rain moving in across the west and southwest starting to turn quite heavy in places. Holding on to some sunshine towards the north and east, one or two wintry showers towards the far northeast of the UK. And as we head into the coming week, things will generally turn more unsettled, with temperatures close to the seasonal average, but rain never too far away. That warm feeling inside from Box Spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. 
Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats, and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 p.m. on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say.